Welcome. Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe. Hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you're currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel, so please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. Now we are joined by Chocolate Sane, Eli, Tenth Man, Neil, and a whole bunch of people in Discord, so welcome one and all. Good morning, good morning. Hello! Hello, you enthusiastic lot. Good to have you. How do you do? I do very well, Neil. How do you do? After five flights of steps, not well, but I'm good to go. Well, that's good to know. How are you all in Discord? Yeah. Enthusiastic, I hope. Yep. Excellent. Well, we may begin. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as the curve of the Earth? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yeah, the horizon's not Earth curve. What about any evidence of the distance to the sun? Hello, guys. No, hey, no, no, no evidence for that. You're going to need R for that. And if you were going to do it, you need a flat plane to get an angle. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? Axis would require a radial value. But that would Can't violate the value. celestial sphere model. Yeah, yeah that's, that would. Any evidence that you can acquire an elevation angle from a curved baseline? That's uh, also contradictory, contradictory to the celestial sphere model. I think they say if it's a slight curve, you can. I think that's what they say. Slight curve doesn't give you an angle. No, no. Ah. You, you can't get an angle without straight lines meeting at a vertex. So a curved line meeting at a vertex wouldn't give you an angle. It all depends if you're going to do the measurement in a model, like autographic view, or whether you're going to do it in physical reality, you know? But please describe what an angle is. Two straight lines meeting at a vertex. Shout out to Godzilla37. It says, ask virus what double speak is, and you'll get two different answers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good one. I had this whole segment on my show lasting like 20 minutes was where he great. was denying that he's double speaking, and he really, really doubled down on that. Ugh. Any scientific evidence of gravity? What's it's that? a work in progress. They don't know what it is yet, but they're already willing to designate it as scientific, though. Well, whether it's Newtonian or Einsteinian, it's how you live on the outside of a ball, right? Both of those are trying to describe how that's possible. So abracadabra would have the same meaning, then? Since there's no proof for that? Well, 
thinking you live on the outside of a ball is con contradictory to the celestial sphere model. It's also contradictory to everything that you've ever experienced in your life. So there's that. Everything drops down to the ground, though, doesn't it? No, gas doesn't go down, go boom, boom, like bouncy balls poured into a fish tank. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? Not yet. I mean, nobody in that field no, applies the scientific method, so they it's could not, still it, choose to do it. It under uses the scientific method. <laughs> Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth? Oh, I think they measured it once, but then they lost the technology and it's too painful to put it back together. Matt Will East, are you new? Hi, um, I've been, been listening for a good while, Nathan. Good to have you. Thanks for having me. Ah, pleasure. Where were we? Any evidence you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? No, the definition of pressure answers that. May I the speak? The universe is the container. Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Well, from what I've been hearing, because there's a gradient, that means there is no container. What kind of gradient? A gas pressure gradient. Gas pressure gradient. All right. Well, to have gas pressure, you need a container. So first gas pressure, then gas pressure gradient. Just the fact that you have gas pressure gradient means you're not in a vacuum. Gas pressure gradient's a delta of gas pressure is the point. So in order to have gas pressure, you first need containment. Then you develop gas pressure, then you develop a gas pressure gradient if you've got a complex dynamic system. But what about the equalization of the gases? You live because in a dynamic, in a dynamic system. Oh dear. If you were in the vacuum. Do, do we have boundaries to how far we can uh, travel, or can we infinitely travel uh, the I, east, west, north, and south? Good question. I don't know. Good question. Anybody else care to answer? I have no well, idea. Well, it's kind of a kind of a silly question, really, uh, because people have boundaries of travel based on what kind of shoes they wear, or you know how many granola bars they've stuck in their back pocket. So I think we know what he means contextually, though. Yeah, but in a way, it's reifying lines on a map and you know i think at the level of uh inquiry we're dealing with here it's kind of a silly question isn't it no i think we've been lied to about the land that we stand on it's not unreasonable to extrapolate that into they've lied about the land we've stood on and there might be more of it right that's fair enough but what i'm saying is for a person to discover what the contours of that land are uh, would actually require that you stuff your back pockets with uh, granola bars and get some good shoes and start walking, you know, take with you some uh, measuring instruments such as a compass and a sextant and uh, figure out where you are based on how far you've moved 
and what you've <laughs> observed about the topography, what's going on in the celestial, you know, supposed sphere, and so on and so forth. So uh, when we ask questions about whether we've been lied to about how far we can or can't travel, I mean, my view is that uh, most people in the West today are so cloistered by their uh, digital prisons that they actually have no idea where anything is outside of uh, mere pictorial descriptions. Right, but when it comes to navigation, that's what we've got. So I can be reasonably assured in terms of them mapping out where the stars are going to be at a given time. So allegedly they've known for thousands of years and can plot them and predict them. Not really a prediction, just watching a clock go around and then saying after minute one, minute two will come next. That's what, that's where we're at with the stage that we know the stars like the back are around. Hence we have almanacs and we can say where they're going to be with great accuracy. But that only works within the limitations of the land that they've told us we've got on the maps that we've got that all function the same way, which is flat. So yeah, we can use the angle measurements and the compass and navigation and say it's flat, because it is, that's how it functions. But that only limits us to what they've designated from the kings and queens and rulers of the world down to us at the peasants by way of their maps. That's all we have to go on. Well, if you go back, and I have with Martin Leitke through the history of mapping. And you can see that there's radical changes that come about in terms of the land, the layout, and various other aspects of it, how it's depicted more than anything else. So therefore, given the vast swathes of different maps and different map layouts, would you not say that that squarely points at there being more deception in that particular area than any other, given the, just the pure numbers of them? Uh, I'm not going to like try to translate a quantitative number of maps into like a qualitative most deceptive uh, area of knowledge or anything, but I will say that uh, what you've just said redounds to my point insofar as, <clears throat> you know, if people want to know where they are and what exists. You know, they got a fucking, uh, pardon my French, uh, you know, start trekking. You know, they got to start going outside and being like... Yeah, I agree. If that's, if that's your overriding point, then I completely agree. If you want to know what the world is beyond what they've told you, you got to strap on a pair of boots, stick some granola bars in your back pocket as you put it and go and have a look. That's what it's down to if you want to... Right go to the doors of NASA or the doors of your government and hammer them with pitchforks and torches and say, you must tell us what's at the edge. Uh, well, then you're wasting your time. Now, if your aspirations are to come back and change the paradigm that has very much been locked down and shrouded in obfuscation and mystery and occultation, if you want to come back and say, actually, it's like this, there's a good chance that there's going to be people who will want to stop you from doing that. Right? So don't expect a fanfare when you come back. <laughs> but, you know, if you're intrigued for yourself, go and find out. Just don't expect the world to believe you when you get back here, if you come back at all. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, this is perhaps a non sequitur uh, concept or, or topic, but, you know, Antarctica is like a, <clears throat> you know, kind of a, how shall we say, a dance floor of eggshells within this community in the sense that, uh, you know, some people want to assert what Antarctica is, some people want to assert what it represents, and uh, as far as I've always understood it, it's a place that's so cold and bereft of food that the mere physical fact of traveling there like necessarily precludes the gathering of any intelligible knowledge of location. Maybe so. This is I mean, certainly that's habitable. I, I mean, there's certainly people down there now. So, yeah, it's habitable. But useful? I don't know. I don't know what it, I don't know enough about it. Even people who've been down there are very vague about it. So, when I interviewed Robert Shortman about it, Yes, he's running the plumbing and they're doing 
quote unquote tests down there and breaking a lot of what would be their claim to be rules about how you should deal with the environment when you're down there. But aside from that, did it gleam any unique knowledge beyond the fact that there isn't a 24 hour sun down there, according to his account? Well, no. I mean, that was the primary focus when I interviewed him. Is there a 24 hour sun? Well, with a lot of stuttering and stammering, he described how it came up on the horizon and went back down again and never went round him in a full circle. I know there isn't, according to him. But that's it. That's I don't have any information. Now, there's also a lot of misinformation about Antarctica, and it's mapped out in a million different ways. Sometimes it's ma mapped as two different places. Sometimes it's mapped as like a wall all the way around the outside edge of a... Uh, a load of land in the middle sometimes it's mapped as a, a a single island it's mapped in all sorts of different ways sometimes it's mapped as a a long ridge a long flat ridge so you can see it in all sorts of different ways and does that mean we know anything about it well no we don't we sincerely do not know very much about antarctica but more often than not when there's a magic trick going on <laughs> i trained in magic at college as sad as that may sound the whole point is to have one hand getting your attention so that you don't see what the other hand is doing. So when they hold up something like Antarctica for us to discuss, me, I look at that and go, where's the other hand? <laughs> What's it doing? <laughs> As opposed to, yeah, look at his hand with Antarctica in it. Cl pay close attention to it, even more closely. Look, he's, he's holding it up. Now he's telling us that we shouldn't be seeing it. He's pretending to put that hand with Antarctica in it behind his back. So watch that hand really closely now. No, 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 no. Look at the other hand. <laughs> but nobody does that. I would no, like I get to what you're asking. Team. And uh, wait, let me just uh, conclude with one more uh, perhaps vague point. Uh, has anyone on the panel here ever heard of the author Kim Stanley Robert, uh, Robertson or Robinson? No. Anybody else? No, go ahead. Okay, so uh, there was a time when I was an avowed heliocentrist. And uh, there was a novelist back in the day named Kim Stanley Robinson who wrote a famous science fiction treatise called The Mars Trilogy, wherein he described an excruciating uh, Reddit fantasy detail what it would be like to be on the first exploratory you know terraforming ship on mars and then once they terraformed it what society would be like and then you know what the spiritual ramifications would be like that was the whole purpose of the trilogy uh, and i found it all very fascinating uh not necessarily because i believe that that's how it would play out on Mars per se, but because I thought it was an interesting study in human psychology. Uh, but he only wrote two other famous books. Uh, the first one was called The Years of Rice and Salt, wherein this author, Kim Stanley Robinson, tried to imagine what history would be like if the Black Plague exterminated all Europeans, which we don't want to go into at all on this show. And then the other book that he wrote, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it pertained to what the grisly details of training for a space mission on Antarctica is like. And so the sense that I got from reading that book when I was young, when I was like 18 or 17 or 18, uh, was that the actual data set that this person came to understand what Mars colonization was like was completely derived from his, you know, sort of gleaning through uh, – like journals of people who had worked at Antarctic bases. And I think the whole terraforming project, insofar as it's uh, conveyed to us through the media, is entirely generated like through the tunnels of fiction, if you will. Uh, by actual 
experience, actual, uh, you know, sort of journalism that's done in Antarctica. And so, yes, like we can't make any grandiose claims about what Antarctica is or what it does. But I do think it's really interesting that uh, as far as, uh, you know, stand-ins for uh, far-off planetary surfaces, like, it's always Antarctica. Nobody ever goes to the Arctic, in other words, to simulate space. It's always the Antarctic, and I think that's interesting. Well, so I, my, I think uh, go on, Paul. Nathan demonstrated. Oh, John, sorry. Go on. I was going to say, uh, you demonstrated the magic trick pretty well. You said down there five times when you were referring to Antarctica. <laughs> right on. Mm, good point. That's a good point. So conceptually, you've got a begging the question fallacy of uh, hemisphere when you're talking about Antarctica. But perhaps in Damn my... Damn it. <laughs> they got me again. Well, it's it's part of the language, but that's how how we're kept in bondage, so to speak, because of our language. You know, atmosphere. People are so used to saying it, and are not used to us saying atmo what now, because they're just used to saying it. it's just the word that means air to them. So when you say, well, no, air isn't sphere shaped, that word implies that it's wrapped around the edges of a sphere shaped air and a, vac a ball in a vacuum. They haven't contemplated it. It's just part of the language. Now, we're not saying you're guilty of begging the question of a hemisphere and putting Antarctica on the bottom of it, but you are by pure language use. So, hey, Adam. I don't think that's the entirety of the point, though. I was just going to say the left hand showing you one thing and the right hand not doing another could be exactly that. Maybe the Arctic is much more important in terms of what it has to offer and what what use it may present and what it might tell us about our world. Therefore, maybe that's where we should be looking. I don't know. I'm not that interested in looking, personally. It's an interesting... Can I just uh, offer, like, a, just, just a one very uh, simpleton... Shaman. Hold on, just one sec. One sec. Okay, Shaman. I think someone else wants to respond to you. Was that Adam? Well, just, I think it was Adam. Yeah, just, yeah just, just in terms of what you're saying, in terms of Arctic and Antarctic... We've no idea, um, Antarctica, what it is, these treaties, there's all these things. But what we do have with the Arctic is history that tells us what we're being told now is a complete and utter um, opposition to what was claimed there in the past, be that previous maps, people that built the globe, even put land masses up there. And yet nowadays we're told... There used to be ice, but global warming, there isn't. It's just water. Don't look here. Don't look here. So I think with everything in the flat Earth, the, the reverse is always the truth. They, they want you to gossip about Antarctica, but the truth, and it's a lot nearer, is in the Arctic. And it's got the contradictions of hundreds of years, missing islands, whole massive continents being there. It's very interesting that history would portray that area like that, and we have that total contradiction now. So either they're completely delusional in the past, or maybe there is something that's worth investigating, but say, I'm not getting on a boat either. <laughs> my my wife asked me where the North Pole had gone. So we got a, I'm sure I've mentioned this before, we get a, a regular subscription to this thing called Banjo Robinson. It comes with a great big map. She was like, where's the area where Santa used to be when we had maps put in front of us as kids? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> It's not there. No, it's, it's all turned to water. There's nothing there, apparently. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Eventually, there won't be any reference to it. <laughs> It'll just be Antarctica down there. Hey, Brian. Well, we got to the... Like, we started talking... We went off on a tangent there, but my question was based off the question, the housekeeping question of gas pressure without a container. That's why I said, can we travel infinitely in, in all directions? Gotcha. Uh, well, when you have people try and tie you down to a dome, the then next step will be, well, why haven't you gone to the edges of where you claim it is, which is Antarctica? And that ties nicely into us all being in the same paradigm of this is the amount of land we've got and we're in a snow globe. Well, I don't know what the 
container is or what its parameters are or how it functions or what it's made of. I don't know anything about it. I just know the antecedent consequent relationship that it is gas pressure and containment. So while there must be a container of some description, I don't know what it is and I don't know where it is. So it doesn't concern me. Uh, uh, you know, when you travel, if you're the guy get with the granola bars in your back pocket, so long as you're still breathing, don't worry about it. I was, I was trying to say something about that earlier before we went off. Um, can you have a dynamic system that sustains life in the vacuum of space? No. Well, only if you have Star Trek theme music behind that. Space, what, you say? What Tenth saying is, can you have the heliocentric system, which is very literally what he just asked about, a dynamic gas pressure system in amidst a vacuum? That's, that's Earth in a vacuum. Look, it's on screen now as a cartoon. There it is. Earth with gas pressure in a vacuum. It's absolutely absurd. Right, so get, when they getting, say... Getting light from another ball of gas in a vacuum. Right. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Just a load of violations of natural law on screen right there. You can, So when they say gas pressure gradient, uh, which is... Obviously, wouldn't be there without the gas pressure first. It, it pretty much seals the deal. That's yeah, space joke. is fake. Go on. That's that's not nah, the gradients, the okey doke, because <laughs> you need the gas pressure first. So why are you talking about gas pressure gradients? And well, is there any gas supernatural intersect? Is there any gas pressure? Gradient gas fill-up stations on the way to Mars, where people can stop by and fill up air. I mean, there is no travelling well, to Mars. Okay. We've just we've just debunked no, no, no. the area you'd have to travel through to get to that light in the sky. So there is no sky vacuum to travel through to get to Mars or the Moon. No, I know that. I'm just saying that the argument gas pressure gradient is so weak. You wouldn't even have that without a container uh, that they're trying to make it sound like you have gas pressure gradients in the middle of nowhere, like fill up stations on the way to uh, travel in uh, this violation called outer space. Right. Well, they call them stars, don't they? Just random gas pressure in a nice little contained area that's not contained. It's nonsense, but that's what they've got. That's what your stars are. Just little violations of the second law of thermodynamics twinkling away. Has anyone ever claimed that, or have you ever heard anyone claim that it's held, held on supernaturally? The what supernaturally? The, the, like the heliocentric model can exist because we don't have a natural explanation for why the atmosphere is connected, or... It's not uh, going into the vacuum. It's actually supernaturally held so, there. Uh, so going into the assumption that there is still a, a sky vacuum, but we just don't have an explanation for that, begging the question fallacy that now assumes we've got a sky vacuum. It just doesn't have the capability of violating natural law. Well, then we wouldn't have the natural law anymore. So it's just a way of begging the question when they say, if I appeal to my sky vacuum and say, there is a sky vacuum, I just beg the question a bit, but gas isn't going into it. We just need to explain why my assumption of a sky vacuum in its violation of the second law of thermodynamics format isn't violating the second law of thermodynamics. We need to work that out after I assume it's true. No, it's just a begging the question fallacy. So typically when Wait, I ask people I the question, the, I'll say... Can I answer the question? Well, I'll just, I'll just give you the question and how I format it before you do, which is to say, without assuming to your fundamentalist religious belief that the sky is a vacuum, how can we have gas pressure without a container? So don't just point at the sky and assume it's a vacuum, in other words. But go ahead. Yeah, so the supernatural explanation is that the very contours of geometry are such that gas, when normally observed, uh, expands, doesn't expand into space because we can invoke a supernatural entity known as gravity. Now, I describe it as supernatural because if it was a force, it would be natural, and it would be manipulable, 
it would be something that we could possibly uh, do science on, uh, forgive my colloquialism. But because of the way it's currently described, which is to say that gravity <clears throat> can actually affect, for example, the distance between 1.2 and 1.3 meters by expanding the actual space between 1.2 and 1.3 meters, that there is actually a supernatural effect occurring which causes gas to be reflected against uh, its natural no, that, inclination to expand into space. And that is a supernatural no, that's, that's explanation. Not, that's, not the, that's not relativity. Oh, I mean, this on. is my interpretation of it, but I would call it supernatural nonetheless. No, the, 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 the gas going into, into outer space or not going into outer space uh, has nothing to do with relativity. Relativity said nothing about that. Yeah, so if you have people making up stuff like that, then or if you make it up, then you're all wrong. You can't be making up. That's not relativity. Relativity says nothing about that. Yes, that's correct. But you're trying to flog that it's supernatural. What can you define what supernatural means? Well, supernatural would be uh, that which is super, as in above the natural which is to say <clears throat> natural objects have certain causal relationships between one another, and these can all be superseded by an unseen, unknowable entity, which we will still assert is true, because it's the only possible thing, metaphysically speaking, which can tie all of our observations together. But the only part of a sky vacuum that falls into that is the assumption of the sky vacuum in the first place, and it's not something you're experiencing. You're well, I know that. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that the uh, explanation from the, you know, uh, counter, the the controvert, as it were, is that in this one instance, uh, there is literally a magic boundary between the gas that surrounds us and a mathematically conjectured infinite space. I Why see. would you call an antecedent to gas pressure a magic boundary? Yeah there's, yeah, there's natural laws that govern these things that would be violated by that. The thing is, they're physically claiming to physically go there and physically land on a physical rock in the sky that they think is physical, called the moon. So while they might want to appeal to the supernatural, they're very literally claiming it's a physical area they physically travel through and is a violation of natural law. It falls under physics. Yeah, no, NASA says we're an open... Is, what, hang what, on, oh. hang on, hang on, hang on. NASA says we're an open system, so they can travel to space because if it's a closed system, you can't get out. Now, we know they don't get out because we have gas pressure. No, I agree with all you're saying, and I'm not offering my position. I'm trying to contextualize the opponent's position within the framework of natural versus supernatural. And what I'm saying is, as soon as you start to invoke the possibility that uh, geometry itself can mutate in order to uh, explain the confinement of gas on Earth, you're actually appealing to a supernatural source because geometry itself is not natural, per se, or like the contours of space-time is, is not a natural thing. It's not observed in nature. That's, and so that's when the, you're hold talking on, hold about on, gravity... That, hold on. That's the antithesis of supernatural, though. So if you're talking about something that's of or relating to an order of existence beyond the visible, observable universe, that's supernatural. Whereas if you're suddenly tying that into things that are claimed to be physically experienceable by bloody astronauts, that doesn't fall into that category. Didn't I just say this a few minutes ago? Well, you did, but what I'm saying is that these anti-flat earthers are trying to, you know, do a double speak routine wherein they say, 
uh, gravity is a natural phenomenon. It causes things to happen, but at the same time, the media in which gravity actually exists is a supernatural. Like, are numbers natural or supernatural? So, I mean, so this it physically is like does something. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what? Yeah, it's a double speak in the respect they're saying it physically does something, but actually exists in the non-physical realm that we don't physically experience. Yeah, that's right. complete nonsense. They, they, they don't That's why I'm saying it's know. supernatural. No, no, but it isn't. No, it's they, just not physical. And when they're talking about it physically doing things and in a non-physical way doing physical things, it's just double speak. Gravity is not a force. It doesn't physically do anything. We don't have any physical experiences of it. So to say that it's supernatural, okay. So it exists beyond the physical experience of our world then. Okay, so we don't really need to concern ourselves with it too much when it comes to it doing things then because it's existing beyond our physical experience if it's supernatural. So, yeah, you can have it. What's that? Gravity supernatural? Yeah, you can have it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, gravity exists beyond our physical experience. No problem. I'll let you have it. Yeah, yeah it's, when really just a competing, when it's a competing religious claim. It's a competing religious claim. I can have it. But don't bring no, gravity, when don't bring gravity into it. Though. No, it's not. When anti-flat earthers state that gravity causes things, it's because they don't understand general relativity that states that it doesn't cause things. It's caused by something. And what it, which is being gravity, is described as is apparent orbits. <laughs> That's the that's the that's the phenomenon we're told that we will observe. So apparent, not real, not actual. Uh, why does an object fall to the ground in uh, appear to fall to the ground in relativity? It doesn't. The ground is coming up at nine point eight m two supposedly to meet the object, uh, and it's time dilation. The ground is in the object's future. Now none of that has anything to do with anything being caused. They don't know what they're talking about. They're equivocating between uh, old and busted uh, gravity as a force and Einstein's relativity. Now, I need to just ask that man who originally, the, I don't know who it was, who originally asked, said, who made the statement that we don't have an explanation. Is he talking about how we can't explain the pressure gradient? Or is I wrong, was I wrong about that? Do you want to fill him in or do you want me to summarise? And I never was, uh, I wasn't trying to infill gravity or even talk about something real. I was trying to, to say like, okay, like say we created a vacuum chamber and we released gas into it um, and it stayed in a, in a, like a sphere, right? Then, then it's violating the laws of nature. It's something supernatural is keeping it there. So can the supernatural world and the natural world intersect where something like that can happen? That's no, that's what a con where, the, where the not experienceable in physical reality intertwine with the experienceable in physical... That's a contradiction in terms. So then, no, like, no. Uh, then nothing supernatural can happen in a natural world? Like, really? God can't come... Here. No, sorry. Oh, hold on. So, so can you can you physically show me your thought process that took you to that conclusion? Maybe put it on a scale or something to that effect to show me how physical that thought process was that you just went through. Can you do that for me? Uh, no. Nope. So thoughts are experienceable in the physical world, manifest reality, or are they supernatural? I guess they're supernatural. Right. So you can certainly have supernatural stuff that you cannot quantify for me or I can qualify physically in our experience. That would be your thoughts manifest in physical reality. You can't show me that, weigh it, give me a value. You can't do any of that. So it's definitely something I can qualify and describe. I've just done it. But when it comes to those two things intertwining in physical reality, that becomes a contradiction in terms. Well, maybe, but are you saying that uh, human thought cannot cause uh, physical changes in reality? I didn't say that. If the well, you said it was came... precluded. You're not seeing my thoughts do that. You're seeing me physically do that. As a result, I could say of my thoughts, yes, 
that's magic. No, it's me picking up and doing something. It's me actually physically manifesting those thoughts that you can't experience into manifest reality. That's different. That's me doing something. Yeah, Nathan, you could think about doing it and not do it. Yeah, exactly. You think about doing it. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one, Brian. I should have thought of that. You're very sharp today. Your your thoughts are supernatural, but they're yours. They're not. Okay. They're not uh, extra. Uh, they're like not outside of you. Actualization of my thoughts, putting them into manifest reality, involves physical work, energy being burned, physical stuff happening. But just having the thoughts doesn't make that occur, does it? So the, t the two aren't intertwined unless I get off my ass and do something. But that's me doing it. That's the physical manifestation. It's not the thoughts being weighed or given a chemical value or saying they have a certain calorie. You know, it, it, it doesn't work like that. But this doesn't alter the fact that what's being described by our opponents when it comes to the sky vacuum is an appeal to. It's something that's beyond your physical reaches. It's like, well, what, what an ast what's an astronaut doing then? If that's your claim. But space is beyond Wait, our physical... It's the supernatural second. space that isn't visited by astronauts. You claim it's visited by astronauts. That throws that straight out of the window. It just isn't Wait, real. I don't want I don't want to ruin your show, Nathan, but uh That's the, you won't do that. Wouldn't your you. current wouldn't wouldn't your current line of reasoning uh necessarily uh conclude the fact that uh <clears throat> you know, convincing people of one position or another was totally pointless. Sorry, because that's so vague. It, it, why would that ruin no, my show, on, number one? And finish. number two, why would you be so utterly vague? Uh, I literally wasn't finished, but basically what you're saying, it, you know, pardon my boorishness or whatever, uh, what you're saying is that uh, the intangible changes that occur in a human being's psyche have no relation to the physical changes in a person's world such that uh, the only possible expression of a person's spirit is in some kind of action. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not entirely, but it's reasonable, I suppose. You've got to physically do stuff. Yeah, the thoughts come first, actions come second, or they don't come second. A, you don't. You can have a different thought. So what thought you're saying thought. is the non-physical can affect the physical, then? Absolutely. That's what but, I'm saying. But it can't be manifest in reality. The non-physical is always going to be the non-physical. Yeah, supernatural can, uh, can affect natural, if it chooses. Well, then... Well, see, the, the whole thing with this, that we don't have an explanation for gravity is true. Like, we don't have an explanation for a phenomenon that doesn't exist and is inaccurately defined. Like, why are we even arguing against that? Why would we because have the, an because excellent point? Because an anti-flat Earth claim follows, which is, well, it's supernatural. <laughs> oh, you're not experiencing, not experienceable in reality. But therefore, well, the supernatural can affect. You can see where this is going, surely. Yeah, that but, was a point I, mean, I was trying to get at, statement. which was that. Yeah, yeah, we get, we get yeah, your that... point. We get your point. We're discussing it. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, and I'm I'm not trying to step on your toes on this, but the initial point that brought us to here, right, was that we don't have an explanation for gravity, and that's fine. There is no phenomenon. <laughs> Who's we? Well. That was the initial point. But that's what I'm saying. Why do we need an explanation for something that's never been observed and is inaccurately described? It isn't causing anything. But, it has no effect on anything either. So unlike thoughts, where you can say, "Wow, look at that! You you thought about building that wall, and then you did it." Yeah, yeah. Check out the effect those thoughts had on your life. Yeah. Now do that with gravity. Now show me it doing something or affecting something or being measurable or it, it causing something else to happen. It doesn't happen. And when you describe what it's claimed to be causing, I let go of a helium balloon and debunk that Newtonian nonsense in a heartbeat. And then what happens next? We appeal to the ground coming up in pseudo-Ramonian force space time bending as a result of the uneven distribution of mass. Is that right, Brian? 
Yeah, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. That's not something I observe in my physical reality. What's that you say? It's supernatural for space-time bending as a result of the uneven distribution of mass. Manifest how? We see that because? No, we don't. It's it's not. It's, it's supernatural. It doesn't affect my reality then. Who cares? Yeah, to claim something is supernatural, let's say if they're claiming gravity is supernatural, it's, a, it's basically, it's like the whole, it's like the whole tangent plane thing. It's an admission that it, we won't experience this <laughs> kind of thing physically. And Wait, please stop. Uh, don't start to believe that heliocentrists themselves believe that gravity is supernatural. Uh, this is merely my description of what it is based on its, you know, sort of ontological contours. What what is? Because we're talking what, what about is? What, what uh, is? gravity. Gravity. And what's that? <laughs> yeah, that's the uh, math stuff. Oh, that's just you know? abstract. You know what that's I'm talking about? That's just descriptions. That's just abstract. Well, I know, I know you know that that's what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is you can't use that as a valid argument against heliocentrists because they still believe that the mere mathematical description of a thing is sufficient proof of a thing's existence. I see. So the mathematical description of the amount of oil burnt by the gas lamp in Narnia is sufficient proof of the gas lamp's existence in Narnia then? Exactly. It's inaccurate. I see. No. That's Objection. Like they're a priest. They're Objection. It's an inaccurate. Person. Objection. Inaccurate description. That means the description is not mathematical. They're not invoking mathematics. They're invoking a, a perversion of mathematics. That's not the same thing. Bugs me out is why do people take up this mission to describe this nonsense that they call gravity when one of the people that are paid to run around as a priest teaching people about this, he can get away with just saying, well, I have no idea what it is. Next question. <laughs> that's, the, that's the part that bugs me out. Why is it he, he can just say, oh, I don't know what it is. We don't know. He can get away with things like that. But then all these other people want to just take up the mantle and start describing and explaining how this thing that Mr. Smoking the Grass Tyson says, oh, we don't know. No idea. Next question. He can't explain it, but the people that listen to him can explain it. It's just crazy. But it's like asking a magician to explain how the magic trick works. And the magician's going to go, oh, I don't know how it works. The dove just reappears over there. Yeah, don't, don't ask about the prestige. <laughs> we don't know how that works. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, I, um, like I'm going to use phlogiston this time. The people who thought they were measuring the amount of phlogiston within a substance, they never thought about whether phlogiston existed. You know, they didn't know the magic trick. They just knew what they were told about what phlogiston was. So, and you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson being honest and saying, no idea, next question. I don't think he actually understands the magic trick either. Nah, his waistcoat says otherwise. He's a bloody magician if ever I saw one. Yeah, well, he, he, he certainly has to make, the to make voice of a magician. That he understands oh, hold on, chocolate. Go ahead, whoever that was. He certainly has the voice of a magician. And when he says that the truth is revealed, suddenly it's revealed. Yeah, he's a magician. I mean, he blatantly he blatantly says it though when when I, when talking to that other guy, I don't know his name, Chuck something, and he was talking about, oh, we can send an asteroid on some type of trajectory, and it'll hit it'll hit a, 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 an object like the moon perfectly at ninety degrees if we send it at a magic speed. He even uses the word magic himself. Magic speed. I mean, he's showing you the magic trick right there. Are you there, Adam? Well, he's so bad at Hold on one second. So, just going to read out one of George Netanyuk's comments. Hey, Nathan, it was brought to my attention that you still not do not get Coriolis and are calling for Wolfie to be fired and tagging me in a comment. 
all of these yours are still a stupid asshole. Wow. Yeah, very incoherent, George. Yeah, now, the guy who collared me for contrasting your contacting of Brian Mullen to have him fired over Coriolis misunderstandings, what I did was use National Geographic's example of how a not actual drift versus the actual trajectory is detailed. Now, I put that on a video specifically calling out Wolfie for putting people's lives at risk. Now, I'm not going to leave this as a joke anymore. It was me pointing out what a bastard George Netanyuk is for going after a man's job because of a mistake made on YouTube. I was paralleling that. Now I've had a little think about it, and two or three people have pointed this out to me, Wolfie is, in fact, a pilot claiming to account for a drift that doesn't happen. Now, maybe it's purposeful that George Netanyuk, a person who's gone after people's jobs because of Coriolis... Now, that was an engineer, and apparently you've got to understand Coriolis if you're an engineer. This is a guy who's flying and claiming to correct for something that doesn't happen. That's a fact. Now, I've cited National Geographic with a diagram showing actual trajectory, that's a straight line, versus a trajectory that you see seeming to drift. Now, that see, a seeming drift is what Wolfie literally thinks he's got to correct for. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're correcting for things that don't happen in an aeroplane, that's dangerous. So while it might have started off as a joke, George, I wonder why it is that you who thinks you know what Coriolis effect is, and if you do, you'll be in absolute alignment with what National Geographic make very clear. There's an actual trajectory that's straight, no accounting for any drift in the straight trajectory the projectile actually takes, and the drift is not actual. That's according to National Geographic. I am factually right. Also factually correct in the statement in error made by Wolfie that he needs to account for that drift. Now, if he's accounting for drift that doesn't happen, he's putting lives at risk. So maybe I should be getting older Wolfie's employer and asking him why the hell a pilot is accounting for a drift that does not happen. Now, maybe you should be a bit more concerned about this, George, you senile old bastard. Because if Wolfie is accounting for drift that doesn't happen, he's going to put people's lives at risk. So maybe we should be actually concerned about this. Unlike your outrageous claim that bloody engineers who are detailing how planes are taking off and landing need to be concerned with Coriolis. Well, he was detailing how planes take off and land and Wolfie's actually taking off in them and account for drift that doesn't happen. So, George, I expect you to get in touch with him and express your deep concern based on National Geographic's very clear and detailed explanation of an actual path that goes straight versus an apparent seeming to curve path that Wolfie's correcting for. He's going to kill people. And I think we should all be deeply concerned about that fact that Wolfie is correcting for a drift that simply does not happen. It's apparent, not actual drift. Now, if me stressing that on a video means that George, in his misapprehensions, that he tried to correct Brian Mullen, even though he himself doesn't understand drift, but felt it necessary to get in touch with another man's boss over it, well, I think it's equally justified to contact the exact same way Wolfie's employers. He's accounting for drift that doesn't bloody happen. That's outrageous as a pilot. So, Wolfie, riddle me this. Do you get a call from Ground Control? Ground Control to Wolfie Clown Show. <laughs> there is a man observing you from a non-inertial turning reference train. Please make micro-adjustments immediately. Do you get that call, do you, Wolfie, you stupid buffoon? Look like it's drifting. Yeah, ground control to major idiot. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to account for a not actual drift you're not experiencing. You unlock this door with the key of retardation. Beyond it is another dimension. You're moving into a land of bullshittery. You've just crossed over into... The numpty zone. Wolfie's an idiot. Dumb. Damn. Wolfie's a complete clown. Yeah? 
Now, it may start out as a joke, but George Netanyuk genuinely does contact people's employers based on their lack of understanding of Coriolis. And Wolfie is in direct violation of the description of Coriolis that is a not actual deflection that you will not be accounting for. He seems to think he's correcting for it in aeroplanes. That concerns me deeply, given that people's lives depend on him understanding how a plane works. And if there's no actual drift to account for, there isn't, that's Coriolis, what he thinks he's got to account for, then something needs to be done about him. Because he's going to kill people. And I'm being dead serious. Thank you for bringing it up, by the way, George. I really appreciate you bringing that up. It's nice that I can bring up the total lack of understanding of Coriolis drift. That's a not actual deflection experience from a rotating platform of a projectile moving through an inertial reference frame that isn't actually drifting, that's moving in a straight line. Wolfie thinks he needs to account for men watching him from roundabouts. That's deeply concerning. I think we all agree. Well, I would, I would have to say that I know for definite because I debated against George on the topic of Coriolis effect on Ranty's a couple of years ago. And I know for a fact that George Netanyuk doesn't understand the Coriolis effect. I know for a fact that what he claims to be Coriolis is only what we call Globiolis. So technically, George Netanyuk um, if it could be shown that he did contact or was involved in the contacting of Brian Mullen's employer to cause Brian Mullen, uh, let's just say, uh, career issues, then he could, he should, like, I mean, I don't see why he shouldn't end up in court. If I, and I gladly would do it, would demonstrate in court that he can't demonstrate what he claims Coriolis effect is, yet I could give a physical demonstration of it in a courtroom, that he has no business contacting someone's employer or being involved in the contact of someone, someone's employer to claim that they don't know what Coriolis effect is, when he obviously doesn't. So court is where George Netschuk needs to go for causing someone career problems based on something that he doesn't understand. That's what needs to happen. And I would gladly get involved. My bad. Just curious to make up. No worries, no, I finished. Well, I'm going to show you my demonstration, my National Geographic video that shows precisely what I'm talking about, because it's a fairly concise and easy demonstration to follow. It's got a roundabout with a ball being tossed across the top of it, and it shows how... Let's just click on pause and bring this across for the audience, rather than me actually talking about it with the art not on screen. Here we go. This is the actual path or the trajectory of the projectile described in Coriolis effect. It has a straight path. Here is the observed path as you rotate on a platform. This is what it looks like. This is what it actually does. So it actually moves straight and merely looks like it curves. Now, the simple fact is, Wolfie has made it very clear in comments to Sleeping Warrior that he believes he has to account and correct for Coriolis drift. Now, that is a total misapprehension of the effect being described and detailed and shown on screen. This effect, there's Wolfie's comments talking about him correcting in an aeroplane for drift. Here is the National Geographic example. There are two trajectories. This one, labelled real trajectory, is a straight path. There is absolutely no way on God's green earth that there is any necessary adjustment required for a path that is straight because it is not drifting. The real trajectory is straight. Now, here's the apparent trajectory. It is appearing to have a curved path, that would be drift. Now, Wolfie said he corrects for that. Apparent trajectory? You're telling me he's making corrections for something that's not actually happening? He needs to lose his job. Because the real trajectory is straight. So if he's making corrections for this curved path, he's going to kill someone. That's a fact. So, Wolfie, 
Why are you flying a plane and making corrections for an apparent trajectory? You need to concern yourself with the real trajectory, Wolfie. As made clear here in this National Geographic video detailing Coriolis, something which you absolutely do not understand, Wolfie. And that concerns me greatly. It concerns me for the lives of your passengers. Because if you're correcting for this apparent trajectory, it means you're correcting for something that someone's looking at from the ground on a rotating platform. So as I said in that little snippet from the last time I brought this up, ground control to Major Wolfie. You need to correct for the not actual trajectory you're not experiencing because someone's watching you seem to drift. You're going to correct for that because that's what you seem to say you're doing, Wolfie. In fact, it is what you say you're doing. Well, that's deeply concerning for the lives of your passengers. Someone needs to do something about this. Here's National Geographic to make absolutely clear that I'm not overly dramatising this point brought up by George Nettinich. I'll thank him again for highlighting it. Thank you so much for highlighting the very concerning fact that Wolfie is literally telling people that he corrects his plane for something that doesn't happen. That would be an apparent trajectory. A drift that doesn't happen because the real trajectory is straight. So why is Wolfie correcting his plane for something that doesn't happen? Like I say, this concerns me greatly. Employers should be contacted, shouldn't they, George? Thank you for reminding me. As a matter of public safety, I would like to know the uh, airline he flies for so I can avoid that one at all costs. Absolutely. I, I don't want to contact his employer. Sure. I'm not like George, a complete scumbag wanting to ruin his career. But like John says, in reality, I would also like to know what airline Wolfie works for so I can avoid that airline like the plague. And definitely not got on a plane with Wolfie at the helm because he might kill me when he corrects for something that isn't happening. I want to know which airline it is. Do all their pilots correct for apparent things that aren't real? I mean, real trajectories, straight lines, they don't need any correction made. But their pilots are telling members of the general public that they make corrections for apparent trajectories observed from non-inertial turning reference frames. That's concerning, right? We should all know which pilot and which airline this is occurring on because I don't want to get on a plane from that airline if all their pilots do this. Do all Wolfie's co-pilots account for apparent trajectories that aren't actually happening rather than concerning themselves with the real trajectory that moves in a straight line? What's going on? Which airline is this? I definitely don't want to fly with that airline. Yeah, I think, I think it might you, would think it would, you would think it would be pretty simple to make the claim that you're correcting for what you would actually have to be correcting for, which would be the rotating earth underneath you, as opposed to claiming that you're correcting for an observation made from the earth while you're in a plane. Like, how long do they think this trick is going to work on people? I don't get it. This is ridiculous. In 2022, this is what we're doing? <laughs> I don't know, but I'd hope, a I'd hope a pilot understood the difference. Wouldn't you? If my pilot tells me that he's going to correct think. the Coriolis drift, as Wolfie has definitely done, I would start sweating. I'd think, my God, doesn't this guy know the difference between non-inertial and inertial reference frames and observations from a non-inertial turning reference frame of a not-actual deflection his plane isn't going to be doing? I mean, why is he telling me that he corrects for this? That's worrying. And in the, in the meantime, not paying attention to that runway that's moving, that supposedly? <laughs> I don't want to get in this plane either. These people are crackheads, man. You could also stretch this, Nathan, to the young pilots or young future pilots that watch him and... Uh, the confusion that it may cause them when they do end up going to pilot training and find out that they don't actually have to correct for it because of this mis misinformation that he's passing along. Just another okie doke, man. <laughs> Every trick they got, it's called an okie doke as far as I'm concerned. Because instead of telling you what they should be correcting for, which is a rotating earth underneath them, they're going to tell you all about an observation made from the ground. They think people are too stupid to understand that, then y'all need to wake up. It's not 2015 anymore with this Coriolis crap. 
And indeed, that's true. But it does give me an opportunity to be a little bit over dramatic about Wolfie 6020. So with that, I'm going to say, if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Primary Streams, then stay tuned, as there will be an after show to follow. But unfortunately, if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. So a huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you who smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, joined as a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member, and all that good stuff. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on a Premier Ring stream. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video. Yeah, I guess. Frantically Googling bereft. Yeah, no shit, you ignoramus. <laughs> We're talking about outside of ourselves, right? Uh, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying human beings all have inner knowledge of some sort or other. And I used my question as a rhetorical device, hopefully to, you know, crowbar out the people who would say, oh, there are some people who are just too dumb to talk to. I don't believe that's the case at all. You don't live in the real world. <laughs> oh, really? What, what, what world yeah, do really. I live in, 10th man? Why don't you hire some employees that are too dumb and then pay them money because you think they know something? When it costs you money, you'll give up this philosophy of yours. I just want to say oh, that uh, there are flights, uh, flights and the rotation of an earth underneath them. If that was happening, flight paths would not be what they are. A flight going from London to Lagos would not be going south. It would be flying directly east to meet up with Lagos later on. <laughs> That's what it would have to do. No I remember would be going from London south to Lagos. I remember when uh, you showed that, Brian, uh, a couple of years ago. It's uh, it's the same with the helicopter hovering, and if the Earth is spinning, the destination should be traveling under the helicopter that's hovering. Same thing. Yeah, well, the, the point is, is that like anyone who is claiming that they're correcting for the movement or rotation of the Earth underneath them, obviously has not thought out the claim they're making. Because no airline would be doing that. If an airline was flying around a rotating globe, it would, that's going west to east at 15 degrees per hour, then there's be no, air, 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 be no commercial, air, uh, uh, commercial plane taking off at Heathrow or London to fly to Lagos International going south. It wouldn't happen. Because you wouldn't be, when you go south, you wouldn't be at Lagos because Lagos would be off out to the east of you. So you'd have to fly east. So every plane heading from London to Lagos would have to go directly over uh, uh, Dutch airspace and then head off to the Middle East or something. There'd be no way. So anyone making that claim obviously hasn't thought it out. It's just a stupid claim uh, that, that, that people make up on the spot. But here's the well, thing. Does anybody actually make that claim, though? Does, has any pilot actually said, I have to correct for the ground moving underneath me? as opposed to just just throwing out the, the crap of, oh, I correct for Coriolis. Because I've heard pilot, globe head pilots say that. But has any of them actually said what it should be, which is you're correcting for a damn runway that's moving underneath this plane? <laughs> has well, anyone said that? Saying that you're correcting for drift, like Wolfie said, is the same thing as saying you're correcting for 
because the drift is claim, like the the antecedent of the drift he's claiming is rotation of a globe earth underneath you. So, like claiming that for a start uh, is going against the official uh, or going against what he would normally claim. But that is basically a claim of the rotation of the earth underneath you that he's correcting for. Whether well, giving uh, it any proper thought, let's just say. I don't know. It sounds like they're claiming they're correcting for something seen from the ground. <laughs> it's like that's what that sounds yeah, but that's, like to that's, me. That's, that's, yeah, but there you go. It, it, don't under, it doesn't understand what Coriolis is, uh, the Coriolis effect is, and he doesn't understand that if the earth rotated and he took off, then his flight path would be completely different all the time. It's either that or he completely understands and has to do the okie doke and tell you all about how he's just correcting for Coriolis instead of correcting for the ground moving underneath him. That's what I see. Because he's, 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 he's an actual pilot. All pilots, all pilots are taught the Earth's flat and stationary and not moving. Uh, that's, that's how they're taught. So that's, that's what they That's presume. what I'm that's saying. What so, so, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So where's the guy, where's the pilot? that has to correct for a ground underneath him moving while trying to land a plane on it. Where's that guy? Well, you had yeah, Will not Wally one. over the there's weekend. Sorry, one day. Come on. I was just saying there's not one because they don't, they're not, they're not taught to account for any of that in the teachings. They taught it's a flat yeah. stationary plane underneath them. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah, well, the, the claim that, the, I mean, any claims that's coming from our opposition, even if it's wifey, you have to treat it with a pinch of salt because because uh, they're likely to say anything just to back up a belief. You know, that's all it is. So, yeah, no, one deck is going 100% correct. Uh, all flight simulation involves a stationary uh, flat plane. That's what it involves. And all actual flight involves a stationary flat plane. Oh. And all, hey Brian, wait, on top of wait, that, wait, 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 on top, hang on, no, hey, you Brian, wait, on top of, stop, on top stop, of that, ten, celestial, ten, please, excuse ten, me, ten, excuse ten, me, ten, uh, ten, please, stop, ten, uh, ten, let ten, a new ten, person, ten, ten, bro, you spoke for like person, 40 God. minutes, bro, let Tom get his idea out, man, come on, yeah, yeah, my goodness. yeah just right, like fine. in celestial, it's real quick, you'll get your four hours after me. Uh, celestial navigation says you got to assume the stars are moving and the Earth is stationary. Piloting says the same thing. Get a clue, everybody. It's all written in the stars. Pretty anticlimactic today. We didn't get to my favorite housekeeping question, which is any evidence that Whiskey Shaman... Didn't just try to run out the clock on the live show. Uh, Brian, I literally, Brian, I what? literally stopped talking for the last twenty minutes of the live show. What are you talking about, bro? Yeah, what's he? I don't understand what you're talking about. Rob the clock. Is that what you said? Trying to get his air yeah. on him out. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Yeah, as ascribing gravity is the supernatural. I mean, I don't know. Let me get it straight. When Arwen did you does understand it, what my point was? Did you understand what my point was? What was your point? Um, can, you're trying to um, prove prove gravity is supernatural, or try to I don't know, dude. Try to make a r gravity reasonable. No, I'm not trying to make gravity reasonable. I'm trying to say that. In so far as people wish to preclude the supernatural from their uh, daily, you know, explanatory matrix, uh, gravity is a supernatural explanation because we're talking about something that only causes things to happen within the domain of what is necessarily supernatural. That is to say, uh, Math, Pythagorean constructs, uh, <clears throat> questions about what a unit is, whether a unit can be expanded or contracted. Those are all supernatural questions. And so not. my point was questions. merely to state... Those are maths questions. Go ahead. They're just maths questions. Abstractions aren't the same as being supernatural. You're confused. Oh, they sure are. They oh, sure are they? Are. Abst abstractions you can show on on paper, right? But they're not supernatural. Uh, 
are you trying to tell me that your doodles on paper are literally the same thing as the information that's conveyed by your doodles on paper? Are you telling me that doodles on paper are supernatural? Because you're trying to no, tell me the that doodles, the doodles... No, 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 no. You per, the your, doodles, perception, your perception of the doodles might be supernatural. <sighs> the doodles on the paper are literal physical combinations between either a sort of graphite pencil particulate or an ink particulate on a piece of paper. Right. As soon as they are organized by a mind into a coherent pattern, uh, suddenly we are outside of the physical and into the supernatural. No, into the abstract. Exactly. No, so not into the supernatural then. Like I said, you don't understand the difference and you tried to correct me and then repeated the same thing. So you don't know the difference between abstract and supernatural. Describing something is abstract. Yeah, I would argue that the abstract is the supernatural. Yes, we heard, and I corrected you twice. Abstract would be man-made, right? No, I don't think it's man-made. Oh, describing something's not man-made? No, no, no. Uh... Sorry, okay, do you want to show me, me a naturally this. occurring description of something? Or is it most definitely a man-made thing when you abstractly describe something via language or maths? Okay, so I think we can both agree that descriptions of physical objects are not themselves physical, right? Right, a physical description, a man-made description. I can physically describe something, yes. When I put the words into the abstract language, it's a description. It doesn't make it supernatural. My process is to come to that conclusion and then verbalise it. You could describe as supernatural. Well, that's the same thing. That's information. No, the, the conveying from one person to another is the passive information. You putting it down on paper is you abstractly describing something like when you describe the stretching of units that's your abstraction no that's not my abstraction uh, I, listen it doesn't please. matter whose it is I, that's I not the point well the point is that it's abstract that... not supernatural no abstract is supernatural that's my point I don't, could know why this is, no, it's not. I don't know why this is difficult to understand. I hate to do this, but we need to define terms. Define abstract, define supernatural, and see if they're equivalent. Okay, so the supernatural is that which uh, seems to the human mind to precede the emergence of the natural. Of or relating to an order of existence beyond the physical, observable universe. That's right. supernatural. Pseudoscience. Right. So nobody's claiming science, so it's not pseudoscience. So right. enough yeah, of that talk. That just, that, now, what's abstract mean? Well, you're the one with the dictionary. You tell me. Existing in thought as an idea, but not having a physical or concrete existence. Right. Do these <laughs> things... They don't sound equivalent to me. Those two definitions don't sound equivalent. Well, there's a uh, false economy in place, so... It's Sorry, not just I couldn't understand natural what you said. or supernatural. It's not just natural or supernatural. There's man-made that needs to be included in this synthetic project yeah. yes it's not just yeah i'm not talking about i'm not talking about synthetics uh do you guys believe for example that a line is synthetic a line yeah just any old line well you again we're back to the abstract description which would fall under man-made Right, so you think can, that can, lines can are man-made. Hang on, I'll give you Quantum Eraser's example. Look out. 
there's a tiger behind you, right? Someone shouting that to someone else. That's information. That's not abstract. That's supernatural. There's no abstract involved in that. It's not an idea that may or may not happen. Ideas, anything that goes on outside the natural world, any thought process or anything else like that, any information that goes on within thought, that's supernatural. Relaying of, of information to, from me to you that there's a tiger behind you, that's supernatural. Abstract is a different thing. I failed to see the difference, but please go on. The trichotomy, not a dichotomy. It's not just is it natural or is it supernatural. It's is it supernatural, natural, or synthetic. Well, abstract descriptions of things fall under one of those three categories. Which is the closest? Are you saying there is synthetic? Yeah. Yeah, no shit. So abstract descriptions of reality are synthetic. Unless you can show me one that occurs in nature. Um, so is the uh, logical, formal necessity of the scientific method a uh, mere convention? Or is it something that necessarily inheres in reality? What do you mean? It's just a method. It's just a method. Yeah. So what you're saying is the conclusions of the scientific method <clears throat> are only true insofar as everybody agrees that the method is adhered to? Is that right? Not everybody agrees. Just the method itself has a validation process built within that offers empiricism. Right, but is that offering of empiricism true because there are things in reality which are supernatural or not? No, no, you, you can The empiricism terms. is not a convention. That part is not a convention. Exactly. It just is what it is. It is data. It is Exa there. It is repeatable. It doesn't matter what people think about it. I think I know what he's trying to get to. If I could jump in, I've been listening. Um, Please do. There's metaphys there's metaphys metaphysical principles that are built within laws of logic, things that are not necessarily uh, physical in one sense of the word, but they're necessary in to formulate arguments, to make discussion, to even have an idea. Uh, there's metaphysical principles that are in play, like, you know, um, I don't know how to describe it, but um, the laws of logic, the law of non-contradiction, the law of identity, those things are metaphysical principles that have to be applied. That's why when you started doing equivalencies, well, you, you can't contradict. If it contradicts each other, then it's not the same thing. If it, if it, it looks the same and it is defined as the same, then it's the same thing. That's the law of identity. So there's certain principles that are involved. Even in formulating the scientific method, those principles are in play. Now, they're not physical in the sense of something I can physically touch, but they're a metaphysical principle that has to be used. I think that's kind of where you're getting some of the issues. That's, in this that's exactly what I'm getting at. And so insofar as it applies to the current uh, context, you know, we're talking about geometry, right? And so what I've asked is, is there a such thing as a straight line? Now, some well, people well, might say... Well, well, wait, 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 you answer, let's answer, let's, you ask the question, let's answer it. Mathematics, geometry, are abstract things that can and do represent the physical world. Is there a real straight line in the world? Well, it could be argued that the horizon, it could be over the ocean is a straight line. Could be That's argued. my argument. That's my so, argument. But a line, but a line itself on paper is an abstract, or even the idea of a, of, of a line is an abstract idea. It's just describing what you're seeing in the physical world. Plus, while there might be in, in these sorts of terminologies, when we're describing and coming to um, an agreement, I 
adhering to the Socratic method about what we agree in these terms, metaphysical, physical, supernatural, natural, synthetic, we're, we're discussing them in a way that it seems that there are hard and fast rules about it, and there aren't. You, you come to an agreement based on terms through the Socratic method, which is what we're doing. That's the process we're undergoing. But that's language, debate, all of those sorts of things, which are very much grey area, as opposed to what you've just introduced, which is the scientific method. Now, when it comes to the adherence to that method, specifically to that method, then everything changes. Your definitions of what you're doing and what you're examining and what you're varying become hyper-specific. So, yeah, we can bandy words and say, well, actually, if you look up the definition of metaphysical, it is reasonably close to a parallel with um, supernatural. I might be able to buy that. And then we get into an interesting philosophical discussion about the way we abstractly describe certain concepts in language. Fascinating. Or, to some people who've switched off already, completely boring. It doesn't matter either way. My point is, it isn't so rigid... It can be uh, moulded in discussion through the Socratic method. But that isn't science. Okay. That's not what can we're I talking about. Can I get back to my original we, point, though? That when it, we want empiricism. Can, can I please get back to my original point that everyone had such a problem with, though? Sure. Because I agree. I, 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 I did have a, a point to round out with, just philosophy. to bring us back, but you just decided you're going to talk straight through that. So, yeah, when, when it comes to the origin the origin of this, 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 this particular debating point, we're talking about a mathematical description that's abstract of something that doesn't exist in nature. So you can easily use an abstract description of something that does exist in nature. The metaphysical can describe the physical. Whereas in this instance, there's a juxtaposition with a bit of bandying of words through the Socratic method of metaphysical, we'll say, with supernatural. And then saying, well, Something that doesn't exist in physical reality can be described as the supernatural if we go around the reekin to describe it that way and bandy words a little bit along the way. And maybe I can agree with you. It doesn't alter the fact that there's nothing in physical reality to ascribe to this claim to be effect. Well, an effect falls into a certain category when you're talking about the world you do experience, even though you're trying to take it away from that into the supernatural. The world we do experience is covered by a method that has hyper-specificity, hard word to say, attached to it when you're defining what you're doing. Doesn't necessarily apply in the Socratic method. That's what the method's for in language and descriptions. Not true in science. Hyper-specificity hyper is required when you're trying to attain empiricism at the end of the method. Hope that's clear. It is very clear, and we're actually not in disagreement, and I would just like to offer my further agreement by saying the whole reason I brought up this topic was to suggest that <clears throat> insofar as the supernatural is that which may be equated with metaphysical, maybe that category of entities which mold our reality, which are beyond uh, physical description or manipulation. Uh, gravity is asserted to be one of those things. That's my only point. That's the only reason I brought up the whole topic, which is to say that when modern members of the cult of scientism invoke the term gravity, they are necessarily invoking a supernatural concept. No, they're not. It's an effect. Gravity is the effect of the bending of space-time. The cause of that effect is claimed to be the uneven distribution of mass. That is, in physical terms, a cause and effect relationship. It's not supernatural. Gravity is defined. Yeah, but you can't bend a conceptual medium. No shit. Right, so the idea that you could even possibly bend a conceptual medium is a supernatural claim. No, That's no, what I'm no, saying. no, you just can't bend a, super, a concept. It doesn't suddenly make this nonsense supernatural. 
It isn't. It's a cause and effect relationship. I've just said this and you've ignored it and said, well, no. The cause and effect relationship described as the uneven distribution of mass causing the bending of space times actually supernatural. No, it's described as a physical cause and effect relationship. Second time, you've just going to ignore it again, no doubt. No, I'm not going to ignore it because I agree with you that uh, the alleged effect of gravity is not manifest in our observable reality. Right, so that's like, the end. So you can't just say it's not manifest in reality, therefore supernatural. No, what the effect is supernatural. That's nonsense. I'm not telling you what it is. I'm telling you what the people who claim that it exists think of it as. No, you're not. You see. You're talking nonsense. I know what they claim it is. That you're not describing well, what if, they claim it as when you describe it as supernatural. It, that isn't what they claim it as. Maybe I'm giving them too much credit. Maybe you're just making up nonsense about what our opponents claim. No, I'm well, really is, trying to like... Go ahead. It may be possible It may be possible that you've been around too many anti-flat earthers and you've been caught up in the sophistry part of it. I said that earlier. You know, was yeah. it you that offered up Rufy's these bent lines almost look straight? Was that you? No, never. No, my bad. But it's the same thing. If you spend enough time around our opponents, that would be anti-flat earthers, they'll lead you to believe that gravity's some supernatural... No, it isn't. It's the uneven distribution of mass causing the bending of space-time in pseudo-harmonian for space-time mathematics. That's what it is. That's how it's defined. That's what Einstein came up with. That's what it is. They'll tell you it's supernatural. Okay. Yeah, it's very important that you don't lose sight of the actual globe claim when you're around, I don't know what you want to call them in that regard, propagandists. Yeah, listen, uh, ever since I've seen BMLSB69's YouTube channel, shout out, uh, there's no question how flat it is. So actually, every preceding claim of physicality has to proceed from the observed data. So if I see video footage of the horizon 30 miles away from an 18-inch observer, I won't make any claim that uh, contradicts that. You see what I'm saying? You guys think that I'm, like, doing devil's advocate shit here. I'm just, you know... I'll tell you, I'll tell you what you're doing. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what you're doing. You're wasting okay. time. You're wasting time chasing a claim that they've never made. Yeah, you spend enough time around them, and they'll make you believe that they have an argument. But they'll never show you any support for, for actual real-world support for this argument. It'll always be only maths and made up ideas and concepts and nonsense. So, especially because half the time these so guys are telling you, these same yeah. guys are telling you supernatural things don't exist. So, how is their claim of gravity supernatural coming from the same people? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, one of them well, said the, that def the definitions of word is, words are meaningless. So, anything that they say is likely to be a load of nonsense. Uh, look. But that's, uh, what, that's look, what I'm trying to say. Is, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but, like, uh, I think it's important for any reasoning being to understand what types of entities fall into what types of categories. And the category of existence that the alleged entity of gravity falls into, in my opinion, is supernatural. No, it's wrong. But That's it's not amazing. No, it's supernatural wrong. things exist. Gravity does not exist. It's just a concept. It's never been established what it even is. It's just being described. There is no supernatural element. Supernatural things are real. They're provable. Gravity isn't. Right. It's akin to yeah, me saying gravity. Narnia is real and then giving you a load of maths for Narnia and you disproving that it's real and me saying, well, it's supernatural then. Yeah, you guys seem to have a lot of baggage uh, about was... the word supernatural. Uh, sorry, they're not claiming gravity supernatural. What? Why are you barking up this tree? It's the continuance of gravity that nobody likes is what I think you're missing, you're missing whiskey. You're trying to better articulate something like that's going to help manifest it when we've disproven it no matter what you try to interpret it as.
Yeah, you know, I'm literally not interested in gravity as an explanatory phenomenon. I'm merely trying to explain how it is that people who assert gravity have such confidence when they attack our position. And I'm telling you, it's because they literally believe. Do they? My goodness. That you haven't thing, listened to they one don't. Thing. Who's they? Where's this example? They don't. Enough. Keep telling us what they think. Who's they? When I say they, I mean like rank and file, anti flat earther slash glober type people. So this like is they just literally a, believe. Just a stereotyping they, fallacy. Listen. Then. Just a stereotyping fallacy. All right, fine. Who, just no, forget so it. You're, so you're using people who cite themselves as your proof. Okay, meanwhile, that isn't for, what gravity is claimed to be. As much as our opponents on the anti-flat earth side might be so confident and tell you otherwise. Yeah, it's important to know what is actually being claimed by the actual claimant or the globe side in this regard, rather than the people who think they're defending it but aren't. Instead of trying to think what, uh, trying to attack what you think they're arguing, ask them what they think and attack what they say they think. It's not what you think they think. Does that make sense? I'll give you a real anti flat earther claim. <clears throat> over the weekend, right, I wanted to get into this earlier, but over the weekend, whereas Wally was trying to claim that what Wolfie meant when he said drift was that the autopilot was correcting for the rotation of the, the earth. Right? This is what. <laughs> right? This is. This of course is what he So that's an anti flat earther claim. Uh, backed by absolutely nothing. And it's he's trying to get his friend Wolfie off the hook from the stupid thing that he oh. said. Oh, is he That's also a pilot? Is, yeah. well, is, no, is he also not. a pilot? No, he's oh, not. So he it's another... himself to be an authority over enough to say that, to make this claim. Oh, OK. So, so he's trying so to save Wolfie, Wolfie from his own just stupid clear, statement. This, what's his name? Wally is claiming that the autopilot corrects for Earth turning underneath the aeroplane. Is that what he said, stated? This is Wally, right? Well, what he said was that what Wolfie meant was that the autopilot of the plane sure, sure. for this. I, I appreciate that. I, uh, just, let me just try one more time. I appreciate that contextually, Wally is saying what he says Wolfie says. Yeah, that bit I'm not too concerned with because he's not Wolfie. And unless he's quoting him or citing him, it doesn't matter what he says, Wolfie says. This becomes his claim. Burden of proof doesn't matter who he's citing. What he meant was, like the guy a moment ago, what Einstein meant was it's supernatural. No, no. You're now saying it's supernatural. Okay? Now, in this case, Wally is saying that the autopilot, regardless of who he says says the autopilot does X, Y, Z, he's the one writing it. So let's just get that out of the way. We're addressing Wally. Wally is claiming that the autopilot corrects for the Earth turning underneath the aeroplane. Is that correct, Brian? Well, he stated drift. Corrects for drift. Drift would be the not actual deflection observed from a non-inertial turning reference frame. That's Coriolis deflection, as was being discussed in that thread we had on screen for reference from Wolfie. They were discussing Coriolis effect. We went to great, or I went to great pains to clarify what the discussion point was. And when discussing Coriolis, drift is the not actual deflection observed from the non-inertial turning reference frame of a projectile moving in a straight line, seeming... To drift. That's what drift is. But, Wall but Wally is saying that autopilot accounts for Earth turning underneath. Correct? Yeah, that's the basis of his claim, yes. Then Earth would be turning underneath Wolfie's aeroplane and a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles would only take an hour and a half because as the plane flew through the air, according to Wally, Earth turns underneath the aeroplane. That would massively shorten the flight times of that aircraft. From Charlotte to LA would only take an hour and a half. It takes about four and a half, five hours. 
So while he might try and claim that autopilot corrects the path for Earth turning underneath, the direct consequence would be a massively reduced flight time when travelling east. That doesn't happen, Wally. You're a clown. What the hell is going yeah. on here? We're still talking about Coriolis after all of these years? Yes. Wally seems to think that aircraft autopilot correct for Earth turning underneath airplanes. And if Earth is turning underneath airplanes, then Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles would only take an hour and a half because, according to Wally, Earth is turning underneath the aeroplane. That simply does not happen. What an yeah, idiot! And the category kind of just are... sounds like uh, Wally realized that Wolfie fucked up, and he's trying to clear that up for him. That's what that sounds like to me. So rather than contacting this employer, he's just trying to white knight for the pilot that could be putting people's lives at risk because he doesn't understand Coriolis effect. Man, what a different attitude they take to their own side when they mess up and don't understand things that could put people's lives at risk, i.e. correcting for things that aren't actually happening, like Wolfie is claiming to do. That's very concerning. Why white knight for him? Just do what we've done and say, I won't be getting on that if we find out which airline he works for. I won't be getting on that plane. I don't want my pilot to be correcting for things that aren't really happening. That's scary, man. Scary stuff. But he's telling us that really, actually... Autopilot is correcting for Earth turning underneath Wolfie's aeroplane. Well, that would shorten the flight times massively. You stupid Wally. Yeah, because uh, that would mean that the autopilot is correcting for a not actual uh, apparent drift. Well, no, that's Wolfie's concern. Wolfie has stated that he corrects for drift. Well, that not actual deflection experience from the ground on a non-inertial turning reference frame. Yeah, ground control to major idiot. Yeah, the actual trajectory, I'll bring it up on screen again as I've got the video to hand, is a straight path. That's the real trajectory of the aeroplane in this example. Well, the real trajectory straight. Wolfie says he needs to account for the apparent trajectory. That would be this looking like it's drifting trajectory. You definitely don't want your pilot accounting for things that aren't happening. That's scary, man. Very scary. But Nathan, no, even on a, on a but... definitional point, drift can only be experienced from the moving ground. Yeah! So a plane a plane could never be accounting for drift because drift is from ground looking up at the apparent deviation of something in the inertial reference frame. That's right, that would be the second Flat Earther pointing out to a, and I kid you not, pilot, that the, quote, drift Wolfie thinks he corrects for is only capable of being observed from the ground. That's right, Mr. Yes, you do understand what Coriolis effect is. And the drift doesn't actually happen. But Wolfie thinks he's correcting for it. Man, that's a scary airline. Does that autopilot um, work with the lockstep air? That's oh, don't to pay too much the... attention to what Where's Wally said. He seems to think that a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles will only take an hour and a half because the Earth is turning underneath the aeroplane and the autopilot can cope with that no problem. Hour and a half flight, right, Wally? Yeah, he's just an idiot. Meanwhile, p a pilot doesn't understand that Coriolis deflection and drift is only observable from a non-inertial turning reference frame. Definitely not happening in a plane. And here's National Geographic labelling it as the real trajectory. Do you see that real trajectory with nothing to account for? No corrections to be made. An airline pilot is correcting for this curve line that isn't actually happening. That's scary, man. I mean, seriously. Why is he even flying a plane? There's a lot of these people and they profess to be experts. And often what happens when they're left to their own devices, they end up arguing with each other. Uh, I've noticed this when I look in forums for different topics, that you end up having someone asking a question and, I'm get, and then them getting eight different answers 
and all the people that answered them are all trying to be experts, and then they're all arguing with each other about whose who's explanation or answer to the question is correct. That's what they do. They, it's like it's a, it's a it's a phenomenon uh, in a way. It's a, of stupidity. You know, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind delusion. of funny. Another another example. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Another example of uh, oh, what he really had meant was because we've gotten this how many times when they're trying to clear clear up for each other when they know they fuck up. So why why does this Wally guy? Uh, proceed to tell us what Wolfie really meant. Is it Wolfie the guy that's flying the plane? Doesn't he know how his own autopilot works? Why is Wally cleaning up his mess for him? That's kind of funny. Phenomena of stupidity. That was classic, Brian. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Yeah, look, uh, this is, I'll give you another claim. I've gotten off the ballers in the past few days, our opposition, these anti flat orders. That latitude and longitude. That's two things, latitude and longitude, that's two, is a three-dimensional coordinate system. They argued in math. Okay. Yeah, with me on that. That's what you're dealing with. These are the people who are on forums trying to answer people's questions. Is that what they said? <laughs> Good one. <laughs> is that what they said? <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> brilliant, Dave. Is that what they said? Classic again. Yeah, they don't know the difference between X and Y and X, Y, and Z. X and Y is what is converted to latitude and longitude. Z is what is converted to or called, in the likes of Google Earth and other things, height above of ellipsoid, elevation. They literally, in mass, I mean, a whole group of them argued with me on that. And each one of the group would consider themselves some kind of expert. I know this because they've tried to give me expert global advice many a time, many a time. These are the people that are out there on forums, people like George Netchuk and other people like them who are claiming to be experts, giving people information and answering questions and then arguing with other people. So the person who is actually, actually asking the question doesn't know what the correct answer is because they're getting five and six and eight different answers, and all the people giving them are arguing with each other. The, the truth is that the majority of these people are not experts in anything. That's the truth. They're pretenders. When QE calls them pretender clowns, that's exactly what they are. I had one saying um, that nobody claimed Space is in a vacuum. Now they're saying they're not claiming space is a vacuum. One particular anti-flat earther. I mean, this is what they're coming out with. They just keep changing the goalposts every time you turn around. Well, that's a concession. Absolutely. That's a concession because that's there's funny. Space is claimed to be a vacuum. So when an anti-flat earther says nobody claims the sky is a vacuum, or nobody claims the horizon is Earth curve, or nobody claims we'll experience deflection. Like, uh, yeah, the globe claims the sky is a vacuum, the globe claims the horizon is Earth curve, and the globe claims we will experience 15 degrees an hour drift as Earth turns underneath stuff called Coriolis effect. So when you tell me that you don't experience those things, those are actually concessions. Well, to what, yeah, you what might want to go talk to NASA about that and claim that they're sending people to the vacuum of space. They're very specific about that. <laughs> might want to check their, their sources. What the guy, it seems, is probably actually claiming, because I've had it happen with me, is that he's probably claiming that space in his model is not at zero, because he doesn't know how a vacuum is defined. A vacuum has, has definitions from a low-grade vacuum to medium to high to super high and whatever grade vacuum. So a 10 to the minus 2 would be a low-grade vacuum. Now, a 10 to the minus 2 tor would be considered a low-grade vacuum. Let's just say 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2. So what that is is that it's, it's a weaselly thing where he or whoever he or she, whoever it is that's claiming it, doesn't even understand how vacuum is defined. It's defined, it has an overall definition, but it's also defined within industry, within uh, the industry that work with it, with, with it, and the industry that works with it. It's, it's defined in gradients. 
you know, gradients of vacuum, the same way you have a gradient of air pressure. It's all part of the same thing. So when he's saying no one claims that the, the vac that space is a vacuum, what he's really saying is no one is claiming that it's an absolute vacuum at zero. That's probably what he's saying. But he doesn't understand that that's an incorrect statement because a vacuum is defined starting off with a low-grade vacuum. That's defined. It's about 10 to the minus 2 tor, I think, if I remember correctly. I have a, I have a chart there somewhere, an official chart, that says what's what. So that just comes, there he is, someone trying to be an expert again, who is not an expert, who hasn't learned. More, you can more only today. create a vacuum with a container. Exactly. More importantly, you can't have a vacuum without a solid container. That's the most important part. Exactly, Erwin. Good man. Yeah. Yeah, the anti-flat earthers, what they're doing is they're looking at the arguments, they're noticing how we've won, and then they move beyond it. So they basically take up our arguments and then claim that they are proof of globe, pretty much. And they create machinations to make that seem like the case. That's what they do. So none of them would ever defend the actual globe claims. They're just going to take our observations, our proof, and then claim how that proves the globe. And that's what they do now. Well, you know, uh, if you think about it as like heliocentrism is a worldview, right? And uh, anti or flat earth would be like the apocalypse for them, be the end of that world. So, yeah, they're. It they is. think they're holding off. Yeah, they're holding off. It's the taking it away from eyes. reality and putting it into a painting with endless possibilities. It's, it's like an art project they'll never let go of. But the cohesion, the actual physical world bound logic that was supposed to tie it into reality, that's not there anymore. Yeah, but well, the anti flat earther, they're holding off the apocalypse them you know <laughs> yeah well i mean it's true denying the apocalypse they can't hold it off yeah. it's already happened yeah when, when the black swan uh, uh, argument came out when that came out regardless of it being the same argument being around for years when it was eventually formulated into a proper argument that uh, that could be and is being used um anyone who then after that claimed on their side claimed nobody claims Physical, physical geometry can be seen or is getting in the way of boats or buildings or whatever or claims, they are crazy claims they're making. Any claim, anything, any claim, global, heliocentric claim past, past the black swan is, is somebody who has decided to like, disregard all actual physical uh, evidence and just go straight to uh, belief, abstraction, whatever. You know, if you've gone that far and you've said, stated things like, it was like AB Science and all these people, nobody claims to see physical geometry. That's exactly what the globe was claiming to be. We were, it was a claim that the horizon was a physical location that blocks, blocked boats and buildings, as Nathan always says. But it's not. It's an optical location that doesn't, that, that doesn't physically block things. It's not physical. So if you're claiming that nobody claims it was physical, that means you've, you've already gone into a, a personal uh, psychiatric unit at that stage. Because you're trying to why, hold why on to something. Why weren't they telling? Go on. Sorry. Right. Yeah, I just say, I finish up. I just say, you're trying to hold on to something that's obviously not real. Go on, Chocolate. Sorry. I was going to say, why weren't they telling us that in 2015, 2016, when they were telling us how, how many inches or feet a boat was missing behind the physical Earth curve? All of a sudden, all this geometry we don't see, we're not expected to see. But in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, oh, these things are being hidden by physical curve. What happened? <laughs> that's, that's a hell of a switch. Well, they still believed in the curvature calculator, right? Back then. Imagine believing in a calculator. A calculator that excludes perspective and is really, really based in autographic view, right? That's the, the weirdness about it. They never knew that. 
We didn't know that. We figured it out. It well, isn't it based? On, isn't it based on the orthographic view of an orthographic view? Yeah, and they are claiming now. Just to add to that, John, they are at this moment claiming, and it's there on my channel, that orthographic view is perspective view. The perspective is in orthographic view. That's literally what they're claiming. The it's angular like size a, change has taken place in orthographic view. How I see orthographic view, it's like a slice out of 3D vision. But it because it's only a slice and not an actual 3D vision, it's always going to be warped. It can never accurately present the, the total 3D dynamics of optics ever. Yeah, because perspective view is three-dimensional. Perspective view uh, has a three-dimensional baseline. Orthographic view is just two-dimensional. You can't show orthographic, orthographic view without a flat piece of paper or a computer screen. You can't do it. You, you, you can't buy orthographic view glasses because they don't exist. You can't see that way. No, you can't uh, do that. There's no orthographic vote mode button. Maybe no. the ortho, maybe the orthodontist might have one. <laughs> Nathan around? Yeah. Is Nathan around? Yeah, I'm still here. I run the show. <laughs> <laughs> I I put a postulate or an answer. I just woke up in Ballbusters. If you if you want to look at that. For the read it? issue earlier. Abstract. For the issue earlier. Existing in thought or as an idea, but not having a physical or concrete existence, not applied or practical, theoretical, that's abstract, supernatural, above slash over the natural, immaterial, not physical. They both share non-physical concreteness. However, supernatural does not exist in thought even though thoughts are supernatural, in brackets, and supernatural is not theoretical. E.g., all abstractions do fall under the supernatural category, not physical, but informational thoughts, etc., which are also supernatural, are not theoretical and mostly, assuredly, applied and practical. Hope this helps. Yes, it does. It was theoretical, an you say? Let me be nitpicky and say that's not scientifically theoretical. Sorry. Couldn't help it. Better be. Am I validated or aren't I? I'd say, yeah, you no. are. Yes, you are. To a no. degree. Well, no. No, to a degree. Not. There's an overlap. When to I said grey area, yes. when I said there was a grey area, that's what I was alluding to, QE. Yeah, I just, I let me put the example again. All abstractions do fall under the supernatural category, i.e. not physical. But information, thoughts, etc., which are also supernatural, are not theoret theoretical and are most assuredly applied and practical. That's where it differs. So, no. Well, that's, a, that's its own no. uh, interesting concept, but... Uh, does that definition not redound to my uh, redound. corollary? Redound. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about my fucking words. I it's apologize a, for my words. It's superfluous from a from a crazy inocular. Okay, fine. But is it not the case that given the definition that you just cited and broadcast mm -hmm. that what definition? Uh, the definition of supernatural? Above, over the natural, immaterial, not physical. Right. So would not Einsteinian gravity fall within that purview? I'm not, I'm not concerned with Einsteinian gravity. I was only comparing abstract and supernatural. Uh, let me answer. No, because there is no actual proof to prove the supernatural nature of his models. There's no connection Einstein's with the theory physical. Falls in, falls under the category Einstein's. Both theories, special and general, fall under imagination. I understand that. Listen, you guys literally think that I'm an Einstein cheerleader, 
I'm no, merely don't. trying to. Okay, no, nobody fine. Nobody said but... that, bro. <laughs> Why are you bringing that up? It's supernatural. I'm telling you, gravity is supernatural. That's all. Gravity I'm saying, is no, an imagination. It doesn't, doesn't make it supernatural. Yeah, it's because it's a concept. No, it doesn't. Well, if it's you supernatural, it's supernatural, what is it then? What is it then? What's the substance? I, we, I just defined both for you and provided you an example discerning the difference between the two. What are you? Are you guys off your medication? Oh, hey, they wouldn't me do be it again. Two different definitions if they were the same thing. There wouldn't be two different definitions if they were the same thing. Is that, that's basically what, is that's basically the facts? Why would they be defined yeah. differently if they're the same thing? Yeah, exactly. If I came up with a concept car, right, a car that doesn't exist, but I just think of it, right? Does that make that car supernatural? In my view, it does. <laughs> And is it, is it an abstraction? Yeah, it is. It's an abstraction and it's supernatural. Yeah, because the, because car the abstract is thoughts, the supernatural. Which, all right, my Not thoughts, completely, I just which told are supernatural. you. Yeah, not completely. Okay, so where yeah. does the abstract interface with the natural such that there are any entities within the set what? of the abstract such that they the, the, are uh, congruent uh, with the set of the natural. Oh my God. <laughs> Empiricism. <laughs> One funny, word. I like Empiricism. You. That's the connector. That's the thing that actually makes it real. Whether it's supernatural or natural or synthetic. If you use chocolate's example of the concept cow, you can create a concept cow in your mind and you, know, you, uh, you can create it. But you can also have thoughts of real things. One is conceptual, one is not. Do you understand? You can have conceptual yeah. you know, within thought. Yeah, I obviously that understand that. You can have conceptual within thought, and you can put that conceptual down to paper. Then it's not. Then you're kind of... It's, 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 you, know it's, what um, you know what it's boiling down to? You're guilty of the what? fallacy of composition. Go on. And, yeah, inferring that something is true of the whole from the fact that it's true of some part of the whole. It's textbook. Okay, so you're saying that because I believe some part of a system is conceptual, that therefore the whole system is conceptual? Is that what no. you're saying? No. No. So where you've no, got you're the... you taking... Go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you've you've just... I've got it because I've got your description that you've just given me in front of you. So I'm going to steal your thunder and credit. I better not. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> it's the it's the no, both sharing ahead. physical fine. non non physical concreteness, right? Because they both share it, it means they've both got that applicable. But having part applicable doesn't mean that it's applicable to it as a whole. So it's the fallacy of composition. Yeah, I understand that in the sense that, uh, for example, uh, for the entity gun, uh, double barrel is not always true. And so therefore, to assume that a double barreled shotgun is the quintessential gun is to commit the fallacy of composition by assuming that <clears throat> this one All guns instance, are double barrel. Yes, yeah, exactly. Correct. Yep, you right. got it. Uh, so I understand the uh, conceptual framework within we're working, but what I I can't believe that I'm having difficulty conveying this to all y'all because what I'm trying to say is uh, based on what I understood from gravity, you know, three three it, years because it, it doesn't of exist. the science. For three years of the science versus scientism lectures that we're having a difficulty understanding the distinction between the natural, supernatural, and synthetic. We're and not we're believing... We speak for yourself. We're not. You are. We're not. You yeah, are. is phlogiston supernatural? Is it? Or is it just a concept? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not supernatural. Yeah. It doesn't exist. It's a concept. Okay, Wouldn't proving that, that supernatural things do or did not exist requires a different metric of proof than 
demonstrating that natural things exist. No, Is no, this no. Correct no, 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 no. Proving that they are natural puts them beyond being supernatural. They fall into a different category if you prove that. So all it means is that the thing that you were identifying then as natural was miscategorized as supernatural to begin with. That's all that means. No, it doesn't. Uh, so let me ask bro, you. Bro, what do you mean? Bro, can bro, two really, plus... really quick. Go, go back to the car real quick, right? The thoughts that yeah. I use to create this concept car in my head, right? The thoughts are real, right? You would call that supernatural, right? Yeah. Okay, the car itself, the concept of the car that I used my thoughts to create, that's not real, is it? It's supernaturally real. No, that was conjured by my thoughts. But the concept car isn't my thoughts. It's what I created with my thoughts, right? Isn't this getting into the distinction between man-made and natural, though? Uh, no, because he didn't make it. He didn't no. make it man-made in his head, or he did with his thoughts that are abstract. Yeah, it's pre-made. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's no making involved here. Like, the car is, doesn't exist in physical reality. Uh, what I'm like trying gravity, to assert like here, gravity. so like it wouldn't gravity. be supernatural because exactly, it doesn't exactly exist. like yeah. gravity, tenth man. Thank no, you for not backing like that. <laughs> He's using well, that as an affirmation, Ted. But the, the whole point that you've been trying to say is you think that they're telling you that gravity is supernatural. You just stated that it's not. Exactly. No, no, no. There's different no, no, no. components. What? There's oh, different no, no, no. components to thinking. If you have an idea and you formulate an idea, my position then that idea, that accurately. information I... is super... Dude. The information can is I supernatural. Accurately, can can I accurately re-explicate... Hello? Okay, right? So chocolate thinking of a car, designing it in his head, that's information. That process, what he's doing it with, is supernatural. It's, yeah, not physical, but it's there. It has a, a logical foundation. It has a structure. People can basically copy the idea just by telling it, right? However, the thing, the, what it's actually doing, the information together, the car, that isn't real. It's a concept. It's a concept created with the supernatural information, right? The car itself is not supernatural. It's just a concept composed within the supernatural. It is not supernatural. It's a concept. Okay, but hold on. May I uh, more importantly, do you like my thumbnail? To to facilitate my demonstration of concentrate <laughs> in the sense that I'm translating the explicative. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Eli, why don't you re explicate? Eli, I'm dead <laughs> off here, bro. <laughs> then, then Did we just catch Eli, Eli trying to use that? Did we catch Eli trying to use some more complicated words? <laughs> Let's have that once more. Okay, Everyone listen. Should no, no. Listen. Everyone listen. clear the airways if for I'm, Eli. If I'm superfluous. Uh, hello. Just kick hello. my ass out of hello. the server. Hello. Let's just clear the airwaves for Eli. Go ahead, Eli. Let's hear that one more time. <laughs> I, just, I just want to reanimate to demonstrate the epistemological contours of a, a, con a construct wherein things seem superfluous and, and so on. Forget it, guys. Out. Right, Whiskey Shaman, what are you doing? <laughs> well, just Eli was supernatural for a second there. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, you got saved by Whiskey Shaman there. He did you a favor. Just made the uh, the ribbing less audible. Thank you, Eli. Don't take it personally, Whiskey Shaman. Uh, your thoughts are uh, probably deeper than you know your average Joe. So we're just we're just making light of you. You're you're all right. Well, it's just something that he's bringing up though, like. The concept that you create, right? Is that your own man-made concept 
Or is that a supernatural thing? Are you asking me? I'm just asking anybody. Like the concept car that Chocolate was talking about. Is that is there a, a difference not only in the physical world, but also beyond the physical when you talk about man made? Oh, the thought, thought, the thought that he came up with, the thought that's not physical, right? It's an abstraction. Right, huh? but that I was that's what I'm yeah, that's what I'm saying. And in the abstraction is that where man made kind of changes what they try to claim as a dichotomy. Yeah, okay, but you're saying like, man uh, made. Like, yeah, but just man made, you have man made now we gotta have to define made because I know this is pedantic, but it's it's important. Now did you make that? What what do you mean by made? Because it's just a thought. You didn't make anything. Yeah, there's a distinction. I said this. I, I said this early on. The, the, the distinction comes when somebody actually does something. I can't remember who said it earlier, but it's like if we carry on with the car example, the 1,000 horsepower 911 in my mind, that until that moment just then, nobody knew existed. That was supernatural fantasy, if you will, in my head, hasn't been made manifest. The moment I verbalised it, it became a man-made description of something that was, up until that point, merely supernatural, involved only in the thoughts of my head. It was never communicated to anybody else. Therefore, supernatural. The process. Well, but on. making it manifest, no, no, describing it. The communication it. of it is supernatural, Nathan. Say again? No, what I'm saying... What the I'm communication saying is, is a, supernatural. What I'm saying, there may be a fourth distinction, which would be concept. You know, man-made, concept, physical, natural. I think we're getting away from aren't his all, aren't all con claim. Hold on. Aren't all concepts man-made? Yes. But are all concepts no. physical? No. no. So there'd be a distinction? Yes. So it wouldn't be a trichotomy anymore? Yeah, it's still a trichotomy. Okay, can I, I give, this, give this some Can I give the same on. summary I gave earlier? So there's, there's overlap, right? QE's main point. Yeah, there is overlap, yes. Right, there's overlap. Does it matter? In this Socratic discussion, does it matter? Not really. We can agree. We can agree to disagree. Or we could disagree completely. Does it matter? No. <laughs> Not at all. However... When it comes to things that are being abstractly described as physical and further to that physical description of something that occurs, it's also laid down as a cause and effect relationship, a la gravity. Then you have something that can be applied to it. Then you get hyperspecificity. Yes, I said it once. <laughs> That's within the scientific method. So you need to be very, very specific about what you're dealing with when you get to that method. And gravity can and does fall into that category. So while we can go, well, I think it's this, and I think the abstract description means that, that's fascinating, it's asserted as a cause and effect relationship, therefore falls under the purview of science, therefore hyperspecificity is required, and therefore, let's start at step one, what's the observed phenomena? There isn't one. That's the end of the discussion. Yeah, so you're describing an imagination, right? That's it's almost well, non sequitur to describe an imagination. It's it's he clearly claimed, there. <laughs> it's he, called fantasy. Claimed, it's called fantasy. Yeah, he, he, that's he what it's called. Yeah. Got he cl he claimed that the anti flat earthers are now saying gravity is supernatural. Really? And I've never heard, well, that's what he claimed. And that I've never heard that until he claimed that uh, because that's not the official globe claim. So it doesn't matter what anti-flat earthers claim when they're making up stuff. I mean, this last uh, uh, summary that Nathan gave was perfect uh, because it doesn't exist. I never heard that before. Who who's put Christy a name Shaman to this? said that. Who's put who's putting their no, not what 
I'm saying the anti-flat earther. I want to see a flag in the ground. <laughs> well, he, he, didn't he didn't specify. He didn't specify. Yeah, I already tried that. Rank and file anti-flat earthers was the answer to that question. Gank and file? Yeah. Anti-flat earthers. That's that's yeah. what a stereotyping fallacy, essentially, yeah. But true in this case. Uh, oh, God. Uh, Here we go. Just, just ruin yeah, my the point. The stereotype is true in this case, like I said. Um, not the specifics of it. Not the claim. <laughs> oh my god I know I take that as a win for him yes you're right this stereotyping fallacy that the unknown unnamed anti-flat earthers that claim that gravity supernatural that's definitely a reasonable stereotyping fallacy QE I agree with you completely <laughs> I'd like I never heard it either like Tent said I never heard anyone say that ever other than that you whiskey shaman chill said. chill that doesn't mean it wasn't said, though. That's an argument from silence fallacy on my part. Well, it was. It was said by Whiskey Shaman. <laughs> Has he gone? Not, well, Still no, here. not necessarily by him. It might have been something he heard from someone else, and he's repeated, which does make it his claim at that well, moment. To, but it doesn't mean it fair, didn't come from someone else. I, I have heard, I have had actual, you know, people, coworkers and stuff will tell me, well, you know, when talk, especially when talking about the vacuum of space. Well, if God wanted it to, if God wanted to make it that way, then it would just be that way. That's the only relation to the supernatural that I can get from that. So it's like, oh, so in that particular instance, God makes it in the opposite that it's always in in our reality. Okay, <laughs> you know, but that's where they go if they can't explain it. Oh, God, God just made it that way. Okay. Well, it would seem it would seem pretty apparent to me, and I think we've talked about it before on the show, and that's uh, the video programmers outside the game, you know, concept. So God creates Earth with natural laws for the Earth, but He can violate those laws because they don't apply to Him, and thus we have miracles. But only God could do that. So now when you bring in gravity, is that a miracle now? God God constantly has an ongoing miracle to keep the oceans on this so-called planet? Or is that a violation of natural law within the system he created? The latter. It's, 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 like a, it's a violation fantasy. of natural law within the system. If you want to say he created, a he. I'm good with that. Just that's not your point. So, yes, it's the, it's the latter. It's a violation of natural law. Right. Isn't so then, he, since he fantasy. didn't create, since he didn't create the Earth with constant miracles going on left and right because of natural law, then there's no such thing as gravity being supernatural. Isn't that a divine fallacy, which Chocolate said? Well, it is. It is if you could show that there was actually a thing called gravity in the first place. But we're we're describing it in the context of somebody saying, "Well, therefore, because we don't experience it, it's supernatural." Then. So no. Whoever said that? Well, I know what chocolate is saying because I've heard Christians remark the same way to me, and I said, "Yes, God can do anything God wants because He's God." But what did He say He did? <laughs> and what did He actually do? Exactly, <laughs> as opposed to what you're thinking He might have done. Right. <laughs> That's completely right. different. So what's a so divine fallacy? Oh, 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 hold on, I just tweaked to what that guy was saying. He's saying the overall topic would be a divine fallacy. Is that what you were saying? Sorry, I misinterpreted what yeah. you think you meant. Yeah. Yeah. My bad, yeah. sorry. The anti-flat earthers, the anti-flat earthers position, whoever stated that, that would be a divine fallacy. Yeah. Yes, correct. Sorry, I, I incorrectly identified what you were saying. My bad, yes, you're absolutely right. Oh, that's a fallacy. Oh. Oh, on the part that. of the anti-flat earthers who appeal to, well... If I can't explain why there's a gas pipe feeding to the uh, lamp in Narnia, well, God made it that way. God made the lamp that way. Obviously, lamps in Narnia <laughs> can violate the need for gas because God made it that way. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a I, didn't, I didn't know it was called a divine fallacy. That's interesting. Well, you can call <laughs> I'm going to see that guy later. <laughs> you can, you can call it a cop-out fallacy. It was El Bariqua.
Yeah, yeah. He was the one that pointed it out. Like that's what the, the anti flat earth was telling me. Yeah. That, that's well, where did whiskey whiskey shaman left? Did he get upset? Nah, I Aww. doubt it. He he takes things like personally. He's quite new, so he's like, "Are you guys attacking me?" It's like, no, this is a good discussion, but you know, doesn't mean you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, because I could be wrong to say this, but like gravity couldn't be put underneath the blanket of supernatural. But can it be put under the blanket of paranormal? As I could oh, claim that, hang on, I could claim oh that God. a vampire exists, but I can't scientifically prove it to the world. Mm. And vampires are paranormal. You you wouldn't be able to scientifically <laughs> prove the existence anyway because that falls out s outside of science. The problem is with um, <laughs> the problem with that is it has a physical aspect to it. So paranormal, the, the definition involves something actually occurring. So there is a physical aspect to it. So the overlap doesn't well, apply where you need to. Sorry, sorry, go on. Sorry, Nathan. No, 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 I could, I could, no, no, I caught in on you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'd finished. I was just saying that, that the overlap, the grey area in that regard, doesn't overlap where you need it to because there's a physical aspect to it. That's it. Well, yeah, because if my door, if my door swings closed by itself, something is actually happening, <laughs> you know, as, as opposed to gravity <laughs> where, what, what's that? Where is that? Where I see that? Nowhere? Oh, okay. Well, I don't know, paranormal. Uh... Hold on. What's going on? There's someone making a noise in Discord. Yeah, it's been happening for a while now. Uh, no, there's, no par there's no paranormal if there's no thing, right? Paranormal is always something out of the usual. You would have to absorb it or sense it somehow, right? Well, Without think, that, there is no paranormal. Well, I think That's that meets no. Owen's, Owen's description does meet the definition of the supernatural paranormal. Just looking it up now on Marion Webster. <laughs> No, no, it was incorrect. Wow. Incorrect, then it doesn't, because paranormal would would, would require something to be outside the normal that you could experience, whereas gravity can't be experienced because it doesn't exist. Yeah, like a burning exactly. a burning tree. Yeah, a spontaneous combustion of a burning tree, not someone going along and pouring petrol on it and setting it on fire. You're just looking at a tree and it bursts into flames. Well, that's beyond normal, it, right? Yeah, you can't experience something if it doesn't exist. Exactly. Like I can experience a paranormal, something I could call paranormal, uh, but I can't experience gravity. Right, but there's paranormal... no. But there's no physicality to information exchange. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was wrong to call gravity paranormal because something would have to seem to exist. I'd have to have an effect. Something there isn't anything. Right. That's really sad if you think about it. Gravity can't even be described as paranormal. <laughs> Can I give you an example of paranormal? <clears throat> That's very close. Will it so be a spooky this... action? Yeah. Will it be I'll a spooky keep it short. action? What? Nothing. Spooky action? No, 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 no. It's not within physics. It's something else, right? More paranormal. <laughs> within physics? Spooky action? Not within... No, I'm... my example is not going to be within physics. That's what I'm saying, right? A, a, an example of paranormal would be the concept, and I'm pretty much behind it in ways, about the nature of getting ideas, right? There's this idea, the hundredth monkey effect, that says that monkeys, if one of them gets an idea, like how to apply a utility, like a rock or a stone, in a very new way, like almost like engineering alike, right? Then if... Uh, he spreads that idea, others around him will take it, then suddenly, out of nowhere, other monkeys of the same race, of the same specific type, completely halfway around the world, not ever having contacted the monkeys in any way, are very likely to come up with exactly the same idea. It's like this critical thing that okay. happens. Okay. Now, okay. that's paranormal. Okay, citation, right? That's more supernatural. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, Just before, uh, but it is hello, paranormal. Hello, hello. Before we all accept Arwen's complete shite without any citation whatsoever. <laughs> so, Excuse me, a, but the, the hundred monkey effect hello, is a well hello, established hello, paranormal. Hello, thing. we heard hundred monkey effect. Yes, we're all well aware of this complete nonsense. Do you have a citation for wow. this utterly debunked crap that was made up? 
Actually debunked, you say? Really? Yeah. Uh, citation, oh. you are the claimant here, Arwin. Let's see how well you do backing Tout up the 100 citation. month effect. Yeah, I, I could I could I could offer something. Uh we, it's been well established that monkey see, monkey do. They got to see to do. Now halfway <laughs> yes. across stop, the world. Stop, 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 stop. Arwin has just claimed that if you have 50 monkeys on a beach and they get a coconut wash up and one of the coconuts, uh, one of the monkeys grabs hold of the coconut, they're all figuring out what it is and they can't get into it. And one of them bashes it on a rock and another one on the same island sees them. And before long, these coconuts that get washed up are all getting bashed on rocks. Now, meanwhile, 100 miles away, there's another island with another 50 monkeys and a coconut washes up. And instinctually, the monkey knows to mash, bash that coconut on a rock because 50 on a different island did this. That's the claim. Yes. Show That's that. exactly where the 100th uh, monkey oh, is Thank you. Yes, I did listen and I do know this. Yeah, I'm just summarising what you've claimed. Now I want you to show where that actually happened. Go. Which is not the same as monkey see, monkey do. I know that. That's right. All yes, right. looking for a citation. The case study. Yeah, I'm sorry, example. I don't have the book works. This is stuff I was into like 25 years ago. That's a great excuse. When there was no internet. <laughs> Yeah, that's fascinating. So can you show me an example before anybody accepts that this is actually the case in any way to then base some other example on it? I can only give vague references to experiences that indicated there is something like that effect in my personal life, yes. But it's but very specific. Vague. It's a specific effect that you've given a title, 100th monkey effect, right? Yes. So surely there's more than up... your... What's going on? I can't give an example. What, like I've asked you for, and you told me you'd be vague, non-specific, and I'm now addressing that fact that you've been a vague and specific and non-specific 25 years ago information. Yeah, I'm now addressing the fact that it has a specific title. So surely there's some case study that's been done that you could refer to beyond your non-specific vague memory from 25 years ago, given that you've d detailed it as an effect with a title and laid it out like it's true. It isn't. You won't find Jack, I assure you. You'll find somebody who made it up if you looked, which you haven't. Okay, fine. It was just an example of a paranormal effect, right? It automatically... Oh, isn't it real! <laughs> that's yeah, completely... It's the nature of the paranormal. That's completely it's not made it's not, up. It's not if it's not a real thing. Yeah, so an example of something that's paranormal. Well, that's a great example of something that's paranormal, other than it's completely made up. It didn't ever happen, Arwin. Conceptual. I I can't confirm that it never happened. Oh wow! I have can't confirm it didn't happen. Indicated to me that something happened with ideas and how that works. But, but you, information but the gets unrolled. You also can't confirm that idea. it did happen. Yeah. What if it's, it's just an argument from ignorance? Fallacy, pre by correct. the way. Pretty smart monkeys on two different islands. Yeah, argument from ignorance. <laughs> correct. Yeah, I, I actually didn't found happen. something called the hundredth monkey effect in uh, Wikipedia. <laughs> Sorry, are we trying to prove that? Thing. That's why I used it as an example, not to scientifically defend it. You used no, it it's as an argument example from ignorance fallacy. You used it as an example of paranormal activity. I'm saying, given that that's complete nonsense, made up rubbish, that's permeated throughout society, like it's a real thing that actually happens. There's loads of examples. There's the bystander effect. You ever heard of that? People go around Which... parroting the bystander effect like it's a real thing. And when you ask them to cite it, they'll go to some National Geographic documentary that shows a load of actors in a room, right? And they'll do something like five people are in the room, one guy who's the subject, claimed to be subject, walks in and watches them all stand up when a little bell goes off. And he looks around, two minutes elapse, the bell goes off again, they all stand up. And it's like, they're just waiting for an interview or whatever they're waiting for. And after about two or three times of it happening, he starts standing up. And they're like, look, people will just do what happens around them because they're complete sheep and blah, blah, blah. People go around quoting this and you're like, that's actors in a televised documentary. Okay. Where's the actual study of this happening? And you just go back and back and back and back in history, finding more and more dramatised examples of this. And you're like, so it's not really a test at all, then. It's always presented in the same way, with actors showing you how this happens. Never a well, real have example. Have you ever looked into Pavlov? 
I mean, that's what it's that so, study so is. I just found it's, something. it's psychological. It's pathological. Oh, it's not even paranormal. Is this, is this a citation for 100 monkeys? Let's hear it. No, so not I just 100 found monkeys. In this Washington is for Post. what you were talking about. So, the somebody else effect. is talking, Arwen. Somebody else. So I just found effect. a citation in the Washington Post that the, was called the Spud Duncan Monkey Theory, debunked, that, which is the also called the 100 Monkey Phenomenon. That it was popularized, popularized in 1979 in a book called Life Tide by Lyle Watson, which says that this whole theory of the spontaneous sprayed behavior among Japanese monkeys is a fiction that's completely refuted by the published data of the same Japanese primatologists. All right, interesting. They also Very. described it as a hypothetical phenomenon. I was very convinced in other words, by it, some, without evidence. In other words, but, there's some noise coming from Google Meets, Nathan. <laughs> 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 and it's been going oh, on for quite some time. Is it shaming sometime. time again? Is it shaming time? Uh, no, oh, oh, no. How dare I uh, bring uh, up uh, the no. Yes, he is. And he's doing it as a little jab below the ribs. Yes. Yeah. But no, know, like nobody that thinks constantly. that you're just making up nonsense all the time. Nobody thinks that. Good. Because I wanted to get into your example that you also ascribe to nonsense, which is basically under basic pathology from the earliest 20th century, using massive amounts of subjects to establish the genuinity of oh, the yeah. effect. I love it. I love yeah. it. Bystander oh, it's just effect. adapted. Yeah. This is his claim. I love this. This Sorry is brilliant. If I miss you, uh, screw uh, that. Same, same snare twice, eh? Okay, go on then if you want to take it's that on as your It's massively applied in society. It's the foundation of social engineering for crying out loud. You yeah, that's, think that's not gonna real? End well. This is definitely not going to end well, Arwen. You know that, right? That's why you're rumpusing me. No, I'm not rumpusing you, and it's not funny to me. Oh, it's who cares? It's basic psychology. I don't Some... care if it's not physics. It's widely applied. It's the basis of psychological understanding, pretty much. This is and widely, social engineering. W w yeah, widely we, believed. We contradict that. Widely believed, yes. And that's fine. Sometimes we hold... Some, you know, a year ago, we were all saying atmosphere. Who cares, Arwen? Don't take it so personally. That's crazy. It's being applied all the time. It is... Like empirically proven that it works. When when things on like average, this happen to me, on right? an average, but it's always that on an average. Oh, oh, no, not everybody just, works Arwin, the same. Just calm down a second. You're ruining this conversation. Just back oh, and I'm forth. It. Yeah, that means don't talk immediately while I'm in the middle of a breath. Just wait. Right. When I first found this out, I remember parroting off Hundred Monkey, which I first heard from Mark Sargent. And he still to this day uses it as an example. And I've said this to Mark, right? But the first time I found it out, I, I had the reaction that I'm having now, which is smiling. I think it's amusing when something, some widely held belief that you've got, for whatever reason, is shown to be wrong. I like that experience. It, it humbles me. And I, I appreciate that you go, bloody hell, yet another thing I've fallen into believing without verifying and you go, yeah, just, it's just another wake-up call that you can't take anything as read. You should really research things before necessarily parroting them out. I'm not directing that at you. Like, you need to know that, Arwen. You know that already. We all know that. That's why it's funny to rib you about it. That's all. And that's what QB was doing when he was like, oh, yeah, noise from the... Ch He's just having fun with you. I'm glad somebody is amused by it, because I wasn't. I'm very serious about these things. <laughs> and I do well, thread uh, outside of physics. Is. That's what I do. And yeah, you can't wrong. always just keep we're... hammering me on the same spot if I want to thread slightly outside of the field of physics. I specifically announced paranormal. Give me a break, man. Okay, we are. No big deal. With that. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. It's not that big a deal. I think paranormal is a very big deal. <laughs> okay, that's, that's not just what I meant. Me. That's not what I meant. All right. That's a good resigning. All right. I'm happy to hear that from you, Arwin. Plus, just so it's clear, everybody here loves you. Just to be clear. Oh, yeah? Donate to my PayPal, then. <laughs> good response. <laughs> Go on, Neil. Go ahead, Neil. Uh, excuse me. Can I ask you guys a question? Yeah, yeah. How do you get? 
how do you make it so that I can actually post something on the live stream? Because it's like I'm blocked from it right now for some reason. I, that's not something I can answer. I don't know. You don't know how to. You can't give me the permission to post because I can't post on the live stream, not like even like a, a meme or nothing. You know. I probably can, but I don't know how to. Oh, uh, I was just wondering if anybody knew how. Hey, that makes no sense, bro. You got a, a role as flat Earth, or you should be able to post. Well, it's, I don't know what it is. It's been like that for a while. One day it just punished me, and then usually it punishes you for no reason, and then you, it, then you're able to after like a certain amount of time, but it never came back. <laughs> How dare you? That's... I'm pretty sure the Discord gods are perfectly righteous in all punishments they dole out. <laughs> I guess for no reason uh, they just decide to do it. Yeah. Did you call someone a retard for being a retard? Because you hit it right <laughs> in the head. You... <laughs> You said perfectly righteous. That's who you go see. Yeah, righteous. That's righteous. He's the he's the main man. Mm. Or or Betty. It's her server. Is that a Bible literist? No. That, Be no Betty Van Vel Vel Shout out to Betty. Oh. <clears throat> Out the righteous, so hook you up. Cyrix, okay. I think uh, uh, her handle in Discord is how do you say it? I don't have to pronounce it. Cyrix or something like that. Styrinx. All right. Styrinx. How do you say it? Name is Syrinx. Okay. I'll look out for it. Thanks a lot. Righteous is right there. You, if you message him, he'll, he'll take care. All right. Good looking out. What do you want to do? Get involved with the chat, Skanks? <laughs> the reason I don't know how to do that is because I don't... I All I do is go into this bit, the voice chat. That's all I'm interested in. But you, you want to get into the... Wrangle dangle with the chat skanks, right? Well, uh, more more in the in the regular. I like to post in the regular live stream for the uh, the this the Discord. You know, the twenty four seven flat earth Discord. I like posting there, and I can't post there or here. So I don't know. It's got me punished. I guess I must have said something wrong one day. I don't know. Maybe. Well, I got an idea for you. Get a hundred monkeys to do it, and it'll happen to you as well. <laughs> Yeah, if if a hundred no, people only if you're a monkey, tenth, it doesn't work otherwise. If a hundred people figure out how to solve that problem, you'll just instantaneously know how to solve it. <laughs> I know the answer. Well, it might resonate hey, with you, though. I'm not letting it go the... just because the original guy or whatever the institute disclaimed it. Right? It's a mystery. I believe in the hundredth monkey effect. Yes, I said it. I believe. I see that movie too with Brad Pitt. It's the inclination of the that's seven monkey causing the contemplation of the constipation that, to be equivocally oh, res resurgence to the surface of the parameter. <laughs> Arwen, that was classic. <laughs> Twelve monkeys. Oh, 12 monkey. Yeah, it was not seven. Yeah, you're right. 12 monkeys. <laughs> seven. It goes from 100 to 7 to 12. It's seven's got Brad Pitt in it. That's what it is. Seven's got Brad Pitt in it. In this... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Very 12 funny. monkeys is a great All comes movie, together huh? in the end. See, now that's also a branch was, offspring the of the 100th that monkey was, effect. How things come the, together naturally. That was the Mandela 7 1200 effect. <laughs> round out so a huge massive enormous thank you to both discord and g plus panels for making today's after show possible and of course a massive thank you to all of you in either nathan oakley 1980 or nathan oakley primary streams hopefully smashing the super chat liking commenting sharing subscribing joining as a nathan oakley 1980 channel member hitting the paypal link and all that good stuff i've been nathan oakley and i will see you all in the next video <laughs>
Have a lovely day!